Welcome everybody to another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mark's Medical Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Todorovic. Here's my co-host, Dr. Matthew Barton. Is this episode brought by someone oh. or, or some... Matt wants to get straight into it. Yes, you're right. This episode is brought to you by a scientific outreach grant from the Biochemical Society. So is we... That, where's that based, UK? Based in the UK. We were fortunate enough to obtain a grant from the Biochemical Society and they were uh, kind enough to give us some money to support us creating content focused on biochemistry. So biochemistry is obviously including things like today's topic, the cell, its organelles. So you can't, have, you can't have biochemistry without the cell? Very true. So that's why we're starting with the cell. But Makes other sense. things like metabolism, uh, protein synthesis a whole range of functions within the body. So thank you to the Biochemical Society. Today we're talking about the cell, but before that, Matt, there's been a lot going on in your (laughs) neighbourhood. Yeah, it's um, it's been a crazy, what, two weeks? Yeah, so... We were supposed to do a podcast um, before the new year. Yes. But some, some natural events... Got in our way. Yeah, it's the 9th of January today of 2024, the new year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everyone, and Merry Christmas. Uh, so, like you said, we were supposed to record last year, at the end of last year, and then I get a text from Matt saying... Did you get a whole lot of, like, repeated texts? I did. I got yeah. A, yeah, I did. So I got a text from Matt. I got 50 texts from Matt, <laughs> the same text, basically saying, hey, can't record... So this is a good indication of Matt. Hey, sorry, can't record the storm has buggered everything up. And I'm like, oh, what happened? And he sends me footage and Matt lives on, what, an acre? Two acres. At the bottom of a mountain. And apparently a tornado came down the mountain through your property and if you drive through Matt's neighbourhood, I'd say every tree above five metres is snapped in half. Maybe not five metres, maybe 10, 15 doesn't matter. There's a lot of massive gum trees around your area. Yeah. They're all snapped. And Matt, well, a couple of his trees decide to snap off and destroy his neighbour's house. So good job there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, it was crazy. So this was on Christmas night. Yeah. Not, no, not Christmas Eve? No, not Eve. Oh, so it was night. on the 25th. Wow. So, so Santa had already come and delivered his presents. Luckily. Good. Okay. So it was about 8.30 at night. And I was watching a movie which um, on Netflix which actually had kind of apocalyptic kind of things happening. Yeah. And it had like storms happening at the time, this storm. And you go, wow, these are real. Yeah. My surround sound is great. Because <laughs> yeah. my parents, they live, oh, they've got a granny flat on their property. Yeah. They come and go as they, as they wish. But they were down the bottom of the Gold Coast, visiting my sister who was also visiting and they're like, oh, they text me and just said, oh, there may be a storm coming. Just close the windows. Yeah. And I was like, ah. Because at this time of year, you get storms every night. Always. So you kind of you don't take it serious. Yeah. And probably compared to other places, they're pretty intense storms, the average yeah. storm here. And so uh, I looked at the radar. It didn't look that concerning. So I just got back to my movie. And then, as I said, it got to the point in the movie where there was lots of crazy weather events and things yeah. happening. I thought, oh, I better go and just check the granny flat. And so I got up and then I thought there was, because my neighbour on the mountainside, he's a mechanic, so he always has like trucks and all sorts of crazy machinery in his backyard. I thought he had like a semi-trailer or something parked just between between his house and mine. And it was idling, that's what you were hearing. I thought, I thought, I was like, so it's weird. uh... Yeah, kind of, not... Not just a machine, but kind of just a airy sound. Yeah. And then I went to the kitchen window to listen. I was like, what is that? And then it started to rain. Right. And so by the time I kind of walked around the bench of the kitchen, the lights went out and then kind of came back on and then off again. Yeah. And then by the time I got to the front door, which I don't know, is maybe 10, 15 minutes. 15. <laughs> That's, <allowed. laughs> That's got an enormous house. It's very long. Meters. Um, and I opened the front door and then there's like huge fig tree branch just blew over on wow. front of my the door. Wow. And I was like, well, and then the wind just started yeah. and it was like. Could you hear snapping next and level. cracking? And- yeah, you just heard, it's not like you hear the wind like you do in a, a normal storm. Yeah. It's just this loud, intense 
continuous sound with and it all was these, a tornado, right? Yeah, with all these background noises, like you said, like yeah. things smashing and crazy. Ugh. But we live in Queensland. We don't get tornadoes, right? No, that's so, like uh, parts of America, right? Yeah, Where this, twist, Kansas. twisters. Yeah, we're not in Kansas anymore. Yeah, and so to have a, a tornado with. 200 kilometer an hour winds coming through your backyard. We're not made for that. We're not built for that. And so all your trees are down. Yeah. They're snapped. And we had two trees, which are, because these are all gum trees, which are eucalyptus trees, which are hardwood. Yeah. Strong, strong. Yeah, they're monsters. There was two that were like called iron barks because I guess that named accordingly. Yeah. They, they snapped. How tall were they? Oh, 20, 25 meters. All right. So big trees. They snapped. Mid trunk, so like six meters up, yeah, just like a twig. Wow! And one of them broke, and the whole tree went about seven meters until it landed. So, where did it land? The wind, the wind picked it up like an umbrella. The whole twenty meters of the tree, wow, and carried it seven meters before it landed, and then unfortunately landed on part of my neighbor's house. Oh my god! How so? How's your neighbors? How they were they home? No. Okay, that's luckily. Lucky. So their house is. Extreme, like uh, I don't know if it's a write-off. It will obviously need a new roof, and because there's a lot of water damage, probably need new. Oh man, that's chip rock and so forth. That's horrible. But you're safe. They were safe, and yeah. a lot of ha- like didn't have power for nearly two weeks. Yeah, that was a bit hard. Yeah, that would have been rough. Because uh, it's, re- I had power, it's, so it's like real humid. Yeah. Oh yeah, and it's sticky. It, one day was like 38 degrees yeah, Celsius. The nights were hard. Yeah. But we luckily two we two days into it we were able to get a generator. Oh yeah. Which ran the fridge, and you know just some basic stuff, but no aircon. It's hard to you get used to it, eh? You, yeah, I don't know how people survive and just without a, it. To be honest, and just a fan overnight. Yeah. Oh, rough. we got through it. It was an experience, but you're okay. And then we got on the New Year's Day, we got flash floods. I know you did have flooding. You couldn't get in and out of your mm. area. Mm. You had water across the road. So, and it's still raining outside. But you know what? What we have done is we've been able to. Take this challenge that has been presented to us and just like a postman, rain, hail or shine, we are recording yeah. and we are recording an episode on the cell and this is important. Because that was a cell. That was a storm cell. That was a storm <laughs> cell. But this is a, a eukaryotic cell. Okay. This is a cell of the human body. So eukaryotic, just as a definition, yeah. just is basically what we're going to talk about today. Yeah. So not a plant cell. We're going to talk about a animal cell. An animal cell, specifically human. We're going to talk about our cells. Knowing you, you'll probably chuck in a couple of animal cells here and there. Useless facts. Actually, I don't think I will. Oh, good. Uh, but when we talk about the human body, we need to understand that we are an accumulation of 30 trillion cells, right? 38. 36. Okay, 32. What is this, an auction? No, 36. So I... I Got a publication, I think it was pub- published last year, which yeah. I'll refer to. 36 trillion cells yeah. make up the human body. If you're a male, um, weighing 70 kilos at a height of 176 cent- centimetres. That's me, except that's I'm not that tall. <laughs> 36,000, 36 trillion cells. Right. Female, uh, 28 trillion. And how about you? And a child yep. that is 10 years of age. Yep. A weigh in 32 kilos is 17 trillion cells. Oh, so that's probably closer to me. <laughs> <laughs> Height of 138 centimetres. Yeah, that's, that's, oh, that's yeah. Okay, very good, very good. Um, so let's say 30 trillion cells for the average person, male and female, right? Uh, and in of those 30 trillion cells, there's about 200 different types of cells. When I say type, that could simply be classifying them broadly according to function and, or structure, or both, right? So around about 200 different types of cells, which we tend to categorise in biology to make things easier so we don't have to learn 200 different cell types. We categorise them into tissue types. Mm. So we take those 200 types of cells and go, okay, which ones are functionally similar? Fit into this banner. Yeah, and so we break it now down into four categories, which are the four different tissue types of the body, which we've done episodes on, which is connective tissue, epithelial tissue, muscle tissue and nervous tissue. Yep. And so all those 200 different cell types pretty much fit underneath those. Those four banners. Those four banners. Yeah. Um, And so uh, of these cells, you could probably sub-classify them into uh, stem cells and then immature cells and then 
mature cells. And there's different names for them. We've got suffixes, right, prefixes and suffixes. So right. generally the suffix of a cell is a site, C-Y-T-E. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the prefix that goes in front can indicate either where it is or what it does or where it is along its uh, maturation pathway. Right. So you can have something like a, an osteoblast. Osteo means bone. Blast means it's, you know, young. Im- Immature. immature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can have uh, an osteocyte, which is a mature bone cell. Uh, and then there's a whole range. Like you can have macrophages, adipocytes, fibroblasts, mast cells, plasma cells, chondrocytes, osteoblasts, osteoclasts, parasites, reticular cells, basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, osteocytes, periosteal cells. These are just some examples of... Is that all the 200? No, these are just, just some within connective tissue. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So the point is there's a lot. My, but I've got a question for you, right? I want to know if you've got something like, let's say, a bone cell yep. and then you've got a red blood cell, yep. they're very different. They look totally different. Their function is totally different. Their location is totally different. So my question is what makes a cell a cell? What's the definition oh, of, of a, a cell? Of a cell, yeah. What do you reckon? I've got a definition here. What I want def- to see how good you are. What defines a cell? Well, yeah. I think... It wouldn't need to probably have certain components. So it probably needs a cell membrane. Yes, that's a big tick for being a cell. It needs to perform metabolic functions, which kind of make it alive in yeah. some way. Yeah, and the definition of living, living. is poor. We don't yeah, have a good yeah, definition yeah. of living. Yeah. Um, mostly you'd say have the ability to replicate, but I know some cells lose that ability. Yeah, very true. But you'd kind of... Like red blood cells, they can't replicate? You'd kind of categorise it. Yeah. With that ability. Yeah. So I'd think it'd have to perform some degree of well, bio, biochemical, molecular, not molecular, um, metabolic function. So you're saying it needs a plasma membrane, needs to undergo some degree of m- metabolic function. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Well, you'd say that they all usually, the other ones. You're going say, to have cells that don't can't yeah, do those things. Yeah. Definition of a cell is hard, isn't it? Mm. Just like the definition of life is hard. Yeah. So, yeah. I think one of the big ticks is it needs to be membrane bound, right? And I think the other one is it needs to be a fundamental block of life. However. The definition of life is yeah. tricky. So, so it fits within um, what we were trying to say earlier within the the different tissue types of the body yeah. by having certain components of it. So like certain structural components will then dictate how it performs its functions, mm. which then probably fit then with within the tissue type it it's classified as. Yeah. So, for example, you can have a, a, an erythrocyte, a red blood cell, which ha- is just packed with haemoglobin, which carries oxygen and carbon dioxide. That's its function. That's what yeah. it does. Yeah. You take an osteoblast, which is a bone building cell, and that's going to have the capacity to secrete substances that build bone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and it will have other organelles and so forth. So, generally speaking, and this is what we're going to focus on today, if you were to be general about a cell, you would say it needs to be membrane bound. Because I, I don't think there's an exception to that. I don't think so either. Most have organelles. But there's exceptions. But there's exceptions. Most will have a nucleus with DNA. Exceptions. Exceptions. And you'd actually say, we'll, we'll get to this, and this will annoy you, but you'll yep. say the majority, <laughs> the majority of cells in your body mm. don't have those last two things. Yeah, that's very true. They don't have a nucleus. Yep. And they don't generally have man, many organelles, or if, if any. Because the majority of cells in your body are? Red blood cells. That's right. They, they, when their reticular sites undergo that maturation process, they, we, they gut themselves yeah. and just fill up with haemoglobin, iron-carrying, uh, oxygen-carrying, iron-based proteins. So, yeah, so to start off, the definition of cell is tricky. Yeah. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a typical cell Pretty much if you were to take a piece of paper and just draw a circle and then you draw a bunch of intracellular, so inside cell components, which we call organelles, and talk about the general functions of those various organelles, don't you think? Yeah, so I think a couple of terms as well just to get us started. Obviously the 
um, the components that you mentioned were the plasma membrane and then you have the fluid inside. Yeah. So what's generally the fluid inside referred to as? Cytoplasm. Yeah, so this is a bit interesting, cytoplasm. Okay. But not a lot interesting. Or cytosol, which, what's the difference? Well, it has to do, uh, and I'm just going off the top of my dome here. Do you have the definition with you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, my thought is that the cytoplasm is everything inside the cell, including the organelles, yeah. and the cytosol is simply the fluid inside the cell that surrounds the Yes, organelles. that's right. Yeah, so when you <laughs> so when you hear See? cytosol, it's just Onions the fluid inside. Yep. But cytoplasm is the fluid with the organelles. Very good. So Michael. technically, good. you would say a cell is a cell membrane with a cytoplasm. Yeah, that and, makes sense. And then whatever that stuff is in the fluid would govern kind yeah. of the function of the cell. It might include endoplasmic reticula. It may not. It might include peroxisomes. It may not. Yep. And we're going to go through all those, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And their functions. And some cells that have heaps for particular reasons and so, some that don't have much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Now, when it comes to cells, because there's so many and they're so different, you can have some cells that are huge, right? But like, you, can, you can see with a naked eye. Yeah, like an ovum, like, a, like an, an egg, a, yeah. a, a female's uh, egg cell. I think you'd also be able to see muscle fibres, which are considered a cell. Yeah, a uh, muscle neuron. cell. A neuron. Yeah, and, they, and these can be extremely long as well. So the longest muscle I'm probably guessing was one of the, one of them. Sartorius? Thigh, yeah, that would be one of my guesses. Yeah. So that could be on me, yeah. a metre and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true, which is made up of multiple muscle cells. That's right. But if you were to just pull one muscle cell out, it may not go that full length, but it would be extremely long. Yeah. But it's still not as long as a neuron. A neuron, a neuron would be probably the longest You'd cell. think so. Uh, like so the, sciatic, the sciatic nerve would be made up of multiple neurons, but these neurons will go from the spinal cord down to your feet. Yeah. Right? That's a huge so cell. Over a metre long. It's, and like you said, for you, about three and a half metres long. But then you've got other large cells like an ovum, which is probably the size of a full stop. So you might not say it's a big cell. That's big for a microscopic That's right. world. Yes. And then you've got a sperm cell, which is the counterpart to the egg cell, which is one of the smaller cells in the body. So you've got a, a whole range, a whole multitude of And then you have something cells. like an adipocyte, oh, yeah. which has the capacity to get bigger. Oh, that's true. Depending on how much you fill it with. Fill it with lipids. Lipids. Fat-soluble substances. Which you would say, I guess, is the cytoplasm in some way. Yeah, it's just filled with triglycerides, yeah. right? And just So it, it grows accumulates. accordingly. According to the caloric you, intake. How much you load it up with TCA or is it? Triglycerides? Yeah. yeah. Uh, TCA is the cycle, okay. tricarboxylic acid cycle. Tags. Uh, tags. Triglycerides is what you're referring to. But those cells, they fill up. And then, because now they're storing fat for energy, and then if you use them, they shrink, but the cell remains big. It's just empty. So here, going back to the... Cool. Good. good fact. <laughs> well, I'm just, just working off that. Yeah. Um, with a person that is weighing 70 kilos, let's, let's me. say. Okay. Which is me. I'm yep. 70. Um, what, how many kilos of adipose tissue do you think that would constitute? I know it's varied, but... Okay. Oh, I would say tw between 12 to 20%. Yeah, so about 15 kilos yep. is of adipocyte. Okay. Or adipose tissue. So what's that? I'm not very good at maths. And then we go to water. Yeah. Because what, what's generally considered the water content of our body? In volume. Yeah. As in total volume. Yeah. Uh, 42 litres for a 70 kilogram person, yeah, which is what, perfect. 60%? Yeah. So 42 litres, so 42 kilos uh, of water yeah. is of that 70 kilos. And then we go to cellular mass. Yeah. So this just means if you were to pull out 36 trillion cells, yeah. what would they weigh? Oh, okay. Aren't we in, uh, I suppose water isn't cells. So if I'm 70 kilos and 45 kilos of me is water, I'm going to assume the rest is probably going to be mostly cells. So that's going to be uh, 
So uh, 25 kilos. Yeah, it's I'll, interesting. I'll say about 20 to 25 kilos. Yeah, so in, it's in. This is interesting because I wonder. Cause so from this paper, yeah, they've given the person 70 kilos. Yeah. Now they've calculated 42 kilos. Uh, water. Is water. Yeah. But as we know, yeah. the majority of that water is intracellular. Yes. But then when they've calculated cellular mass, they've given that 45 kilos. So oh, there you go. I'm, my thoughts would be a lot of that is water mass. Exactly. Mm. That's, that's what I was going to say because if you were to take that out, if you were to remove the water, I would say it would be closer to 20 kilos. Yeah, yeah. But that makes sense. Cause, but you're also going to have some cells in there that don't have water, right? So like adipocytes. Yeah. Fat yeah, cells, yeah, they're, yeah. they're pretty much, it's not that they're absent of water, but they're relatively void of water. So, okay, so you're saying 70 kilogram male like me, 45 litres of water inside my body, which is distributed both within the cells and outside no, the cells. No, it's just 42 litres of water. But when we look at your cellular mass. But it's distributed both inside yeah, and outside right. the yeah, cells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then if you take just the cell mass, there's going to be water in there. Yeah, that's right. And that's 42, 45. 45, 45. 45 kilograms. Yeah, and so when we go with that, so let's wow. stick with the mass. We'll call that biomass. All right, so 45 kilograms of yeah. me is cells. Cells. Yep. Yep. What do you, so what percentage is that, 45 of 70? Uh, that's around about 60%. Okay. Now, of that, what do you think, what cell type do you think constitutes most of that mass? Well, for me, muscle, obviously. Well, it, it is muscle. So <laughs> okay, but not for you. It's about 20. <laughs> We're talking me specifically. <laughs> well, this, talking... Is, this is this typical person. Gadoosh, gadoosh. Sorry, welcome to the gun show. Welcome, everybody, to Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's gun show. Yep. Sorry. Uh, so muscle mass is the majority. Yeah, so 22 kilos yeah. of that 45 kilos yeah. is skeletal muscle. All right, what's the rest? Just okay. spread across the others. Keep, what do you reckon? Fat. Fat's next. Okay. So 12 kilos, 12 okay. and a half kilos. Do you that's flipped for you between the muscle and the fat one? Yeah, all right. Enough. No, it's not because I don't think – it's not because I think that you are I'm, heavy. It's simply because I just don't think you have much muscle. I'm, it's called marbled tissue. Oh, you're Wagyu. <laughs> yeah, it's Wagyu. I'm going to call you Wagyu Barton now, so there we go. Look, when I finally get eaten by a cannibal, they'll appreciate <laughs> me. I wonder who that cannibal um, will be. Unlike you, they'll be like, if this is a tough – well, let's hope that if we're ever on a plane together, it doesn't crash in the Andes. Yeah. Anyway. Yum. So a few other things that t- make up a lot of mass. Well, that's not really a, Those two things, skeletal, skeletal muscles and adipose tissue, make, make up, up a significant of amount of cell mass. Cell mass. Yeah, okay. Now, the next one. Wait, can we talk about the clinical implications of that, of, of students knowing that? Yes. Because well, that's important. It is important because those two muscles, sorry, those two um, biomass tissue types tissue types are actually insulin. D- is this where you're going to go with yeah, one? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Are insulin dependent. Important. Insulin dep- dependent. Dependent. Meaning? Which means, generally speaking, they need to have insulin present to be able to access glucose. Fr- from the blood supply, from correct. The blood. Yes. So that means for you... Um, to be able to suck glucose out of your bloodstream, you need insulin pre- present. Yep. And so two types of diabetes, type 1, type 2, which m- your patients may have problems with insulin presence or the sensitivity to it, may impact those two cell types. Therefore, it's telling you that a significant volume of your body is both skeletal muscle and adipose, so that's going to impact the way that they can utilise glucose and therefore the downstream effects, what the body then will try to react to by not doing having that. So releasing fat or glycogen or other hormones to try to rectify the situation. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're a diabetic, either type 1 or type 2, and your glucose is locked within your bloodstream, you need insulin to pull it out. But the thing is our brain and our liver and a whole bunch of organs don't require insulin. They're insulin independent. But there are, like you said, those two tissues are dependent on insulin. But they make up, and that's the thing, it's like, oh, by numbers... You'll get, I'll get to that in a second. There's pretty much only two tissue types that truly need insulin. Yeah. But by mass, they make up the majority of the body weight. So they're going to pull in a significant amount of their glucose. Mm, mm. And because they're insulin dependent, that's the reason why diabetics truly need their insulin. That's right. Yeah. So going down the list in terms of other cell types that make up a lot of mass. Yep. We have now go to blood. So this would be blood yeah. cells. By mass or by number? By mass. 
They're heavy. Well. As in cumulatively. Yeah. Oh. Four and a half kilos. So so four and a half kilos of us is just red blood cells, not the or plasma. Cellular components of blood. So if we did a full body hematocrit. Yeah. So if you took out every drop of blood. And spun it. But also blood. It's not only blood within intravascular, but it's also within bone, oh, spleen, yeah. gotcha. liver. Okay, so if, so if you took all that out. If I were to take you and just wring you out <laughs> into a giant tube yeah. and spin it down, yeah. there would be this compact cell mass yeah. down the bottom. Which would weigh about four and a half kilos. And that's what we call hematocrit, right? The hematocrit is yeah. the percentage well, kind of, of Well, hematocrit is the percentage of whole blood that is made up of red, red blood, blood cells. cells. That's right. Yeah. But, but, I'm I'm talking, but, but I'm talking there's... Of the whole fluid. There's blood cells elsewhere. So it's yes. not just intravascular. Okay. They're in other regions like... Red bone marrow, spleen. So by number, so that's a lot by... I'll get to numbers in a second. Because they're small. They're like yeah. red blood cells. Yeah. Are they, what, point, point 0.5 of a micrometer? No, no, no 10 micrometers. Seven, seven microns. Yeah, red so blood cell. Seven to 10 micrometers. Mm. Okay. So super tiny yeah. because they have to be small enough to fit through... Capillaries. ...single file, the smallest capillary. Yeah. How many? Oh, I'm going to get to that in a second. Oh, okay. Let me go through just mass first. Okay. Are the, the liver, 1.2 kilos... Just the cells in the, the cells, yeah. yeah. Okay. Then we get to the cerebral cortex. Oh yes, yes. That's yes. about eight hundred grams. Wow. So just under a kilo. That's weird because I wouldn't even think that cerebral cortex, including the water and everything else, would be that heavy. It's a lot of fat in it. Yeah. But, but that's kind of extracellular. Yeah. Mm. But that's a lot of cells. Yeah. Then skin. So if I skinned yep. you and weighed you, <laughs> is it skinned or scun? Skinned. It's definitely not scun. <laughs> uh, 800, yeah, about the same, 850 grams. Is that it? Just under a kilo, yeah. The same as the cortex. Yeah. Our skin must be quite thin then. Well, that's the... Quite thin skin. Epidermis, do you reckon? Or? Must just be the epidermis. I mean, there's five layers dermis of the epidermis. Difficult. Well, the dermis is mostly connective tissue. Yeah. So right. I wouldn't call it skin. And then we have about a half a kilo of cells in the small intestine. That make up the small intestine yeah. or inside the small intestine? Make up. Right. These aren't bacterial cells, by the way. This Which is, we this probably is, have an yeah. additional 30 trillion of, right? Probably in the same amount again. Wow. So we've got about 60 trillion cells yeah. because we can't live without that bacteria. Mm. So if we truly say you right now, there's probably 60 trillion cells. So there'd be about one to one. 30 trillion eukaryotic yep. and 30 trillion prokaryotic. All right, we'll get to those definitions yeah. shortly because it's important. So now we can go to the cell number. All so right. that was just by cellular mass. Yeah. Now we go number. Right. So this is what constitutes that 30 trillion cells. Okay. So what was the biggest volume? Uh, you, well, by by, by mass? By, by my, uh, uh, muscle. Okay, so if you then count the muscle cells, glitter muscle cells, oh, okay, yeah. how many? So just the gross number. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, good question. Um, oh, I, I can't. I, I'm, I'm going to say not much more than billions. Billions, billion, five hundred and eighty billion. Oh, it's a lot more than I thought. Okay. Adipose. Probably um, more. Oh, uh, about the same. No, a bit. Three hundred billion. Okay, less. All right. Liver about four hundred billion. Liver, 400 billion. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, cerebral cortex, 80 billion. You're right. Skin, 600 billion. Yep. And the small intestine, 700 billion. Red blood cells. Now, red blood cells. Now we go to blood. All right. So of the blood, which was only 4.7 kilos. Yes, by mass. In terms of cell number, 32 trillion. How's that work? That doesn't make sense. We're only 30 trillion cells. No, we're 36. We're 36 trillion. Yeah. So, so you're basically saying that nearly, pretty much 90% of us is red, 90% of our cell mass is red blood cells. Well, yeah, it depends what you call the red blood cell, like what? in the lineage. Well, you got, like okay. you said at the start, you got the, from the start of it all to its mature end. So if you were to... Erythropoiesis yep. or hematopoiesis, so if you were to all blood cells. pull all that out. Which one? Er- erythro all or hemato? We were talking just about hem- blood or just red blood? Hemato. So that includes white blood cells, yeah. that includes platelets. platelets. Yeah. Okay. 32 Two trillion. trillion. Wow. So, yeah. boy, 
That's more than I thought. Yeah. So, so you're basically saying there was half a trillion of all those other ones pretty much on yeah. average. And so they're just making up a very small percentage. Yeah. In number, each. in number. But wow. as you saw in mass, in size, they contribute a lot more. So it's like, what, 90%? Is, is that, I can't access my calculator. So Well, I, I've wanna, always come I'm across of this. red blood cells about 60 to 70% of you. Like if you were to do, you just take a person's blood and then do the count of red blood cells. 89%. So 89% is red blood cells. If you were just to take a person's hematocrit yep. and just count the red blood cells. Yes. I don't know. It's like three to five million per, per microliter. That's, and do that calculation. Yeah. It's probably about 60% of your total cell mass. Yes, because you don't have much. Cause I, you, you don't but have, that's just in your blood vessels, mm, right? Mm. But then if you were to go elsewhere, yeah, I think there'd be a lot of blood elsewhere. True. Wow. Okay. So you've it's a lot of it. you've orientated us to understanding the different cells by mass and by number. Uh, I think we need to start talking about the cell itself and take a general cell and go through all the different organelles and its structure. What do you think? Yep. But I think we should throw in an analogy before we get into the okay uh, weeds. Is it weeds or just the granular organelles. level? Granular? Okay. We're talking about granular sites. Mesophils, <laughs> eosinophils. All right. Uh, okay. What's this analogy? Is this an analogy that the listener can use? I hope so. F- to make all of this so it makes more sense? I think so, yes. Okay. We'll see. So your analogies are, we know historically your analogies are think- pretty terrible. <laughs> My analogies tend to be the ones that the listener just enjoys it. A little bit more. We've got emails where they've said prefer Matt's. But anyway, yeah, but let's that's leave just that. you through another email let's address. <laughs> oh, dear Matt, you're the best. Love Matt. I mean, whoops, love Cross stranger. <laughs> All right, what is the um, analogy? Sometimes you would have heard the analogy of the cell being the house. No, never Different heard. parts of the house. No. No? You've no. never heard that? Or the city? No, I have. Or I've, a city? I've heard the city, Now, yes. we've done a city before. I think we've done a city in... The immune system or something like that. So No, when we did the immune system, you spoke something about the Ottomans <laughs> getting attacked and there was some giant bridge in the water or anchor or something ridiculous. Students, students enjoyed that. No, they did Because they got a, a free historical lesson. Oh, here we go. Matt loves talking about the Ottoman Empire. Anyway, um, today's analogy for the cell is going to be a university. All right. So the cell itself is a university campus. Yes. All right. Uh, now, how do you start? want to start? Do you want to go out in or do you want to... Out in. Okay, all yeah. right. So generally with a university, you need to have the outer security perimeter fence that right. kind of tells everyone this is... Keep the rabble this out. This is the perimeter. Don't yeah. come. This is now a university. Okay. So Only learned individuals may enter. Possibly. Yeah. Now, that is a cell membrane. Okay. Okay. Yep. Now, this, we're not going to get into the... The weeds of this, it's just the wall or the perimeter fence. But we will talk about the cell membrane in detail. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so you're just sort of giving us lay of the land, lay of the campus. So the perimeter, cell membrane. Yep. All right, you get inside the cell, inside the campus, what is that? So that's the cytoplasm. Let's just call it the cytoplasm. You're walking around the grounds. That's right, the grounds. So the campus um, campus grounds with a nice grass and landscaping, unless you went through a tornado. Yes. Um, It's, yeah, that's... I don't have to go further with that. That's great. Now you want to find the library. Okay. Which is going to hold all the important information and knowledge for the university. All right. Okay, so that's the nucleus. Right. And what's the knowledge? What's what's the information it's carrying? That's, uh, well, books and... Is that what you meant? No, in the analogy. Oh, the DNA. DNA. That's DNA. So the books with the information is DNA. The library is the nucleus. Yeah. All right, this is holding holding water so far. Okay, so then we have to um, translate that information into a product. Right. Now, in the cell, we change the DNA into RNA yep. and then into a pro- proteins usually, right? So in this analogy, we have the, we'll call it the ER, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which the is... The rough or the smooth? The rough. Okay. Okay. Now, what makes it rough is it's got ribosomes. Now, in this analogy, this is going to be the classrooms with the teaching. I don't want to say professors. Is that the correct term? Yeah, that's fine. We'll call it professors. With the professors there to do the translation of the knowledge. So changing it from the books to something that's meaningful to then the student, 
which is essentially the protein, because yeah. they're the output of the university. No one's confused at all with this. Uh, right, so let me get this straight. You've got a student who's gone to the library and they've grabbed a textbook. They know that there's knowledge in the textbook, but they can't understand it. Yep. So to understand it, they must take this textbook or DNA out of the library, so out of the nucleus, and go somewhere where it, they can translate it. Yep. And that place that they can translate it is going to be a classroom. That's right. Which is... Could the... be anything from lecture halls to tutorials or prac classes. Okay. So that's another membrane-bound... Yes. It's got a wall around it, yeah. right? Not a cell wall because it's not plants we're talking about, but <laughs> a membrane. Uh, and in this classroom, this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Yeah, because it's full with professors. And the professors are ribosomes. Yeah. And ribosomes allow for us to translate DNA or more specifically RNA into proteins. Correct. And so the protein is the student. Is that that's, correct? That's correct. So once, they've, once the knowledge has been translated to them by the ribosomes, they are proteins. They have the capacity to do something now. They can go off and do something. Is that yep, correct? That's right. But before they get to go off and change the world, yeah. they need to have the specifics of what you know, degree or what certificate or oh, they need what, to graduate. what level of qualification they have. So that's like pros, post-translational modification. modification and that's the right. Golgi. Okay. So what? that's the packaging them up, package them up so ready for graduation. Are you graduating with a bachelor's or is it a master's or yep. is it a PhD? And so basically... The, and that's your identification. So the Golgi is the graduation where they give you your certificate. And yeah, identify you with something... As an says, outcome. You can now do this. That's right. And then you can leave the cell. And then most graduates will leg it from the university and never want to come back. They'll leave and they'll get a job because what they'll do is, just like the Golgi packaging something up for export out of the cell, the student, the protein, is now packaged up with their certificate to exit right. the university and get a job. And, and they I'm can just show that yeah, certificate right. and say, I'm yeah. qualified to do this, give that's me a right. job. Okay. And this is where I think most students do leave the university and never want to come back. Yes, yes. But there will be some. That Not will, us, though. There will be, <laughs> there'll be some that will hang around and do some work within the cell, which is still within the university. So they, they go, you know what, I'm not, I'm not ready to go. I've developed knowledge. I'm a protein. I'm a student. But I want to work more within this institute, within this cell. Yeah. And they work within the labs or they do other teaching. And so these proteins might become ribosomes. These proteins might become enzymes. They might facilitate Yeah, well, they might go and something. work within the smooth ER. Oh, okay. Which is now a bit more specific. I'd love to know how you're going to turn okay. the smooth ER into a... Well, you know, a lot of analogy. postgraduate students, which here are proteins, yeah. um, will... Um, I just you know what they'll do? They'll go to the pub. Because at the pub you can have a drink, right? And when you drink alcohol, you need to detoxify. Okay. And that's what the smooth endoplasmic reticulum I was just going to say a lot of... Um, also synthesizes fats. Yeah, I was just going to say... Which we the, tend to do at the, the pub when we eat a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of bad food. A lot of the postgraduate students will start to do research. Yes. And the research can be like specific laboratories, okay. which is the smooth ER. Which oh, so... It does specific things like... Oh, sorry, listen. Let's just scrap my uh, analogy for the smooth ER. You won't work, so... Um, so they work within a lab where that lab will produce particular things. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you think we've confused people enough? No, no, I think it's actually quite good. What about the mitochondria? Mitochondria is the energy house of the university. So oh, this could be... What a cop out. Solar panels. This could be battery storage. Oh, here we go. I don't really think universities will have um, a coal plant or a, <laughs> <laughs> or a nuclear reactor. No, I don't think they're going to have... Uh, the students that failed shovel coal. <laughs> That's that's the their punishment, yeah. um, and then you've got you got how, like cleaners of the university, you yeah. got groundskeepers. So that's uh, lysosomes, lysosomes and, and peroxisomes, yeah. um, and they just clean everything up. And then all the buildings. Oh yes, the structure of it is the cytoskeleton. Okay, so these are structural proteins like yeah. actin and microfilaments that's and right. things like that, microtubules. Yep. Okay, uh, and so, that's your university, and that's the cell. Wow, the end. <laughs> So now I think we can jump into what they all do. Yeah. Bit of detail. But I had a question so for only you. 40 minutes in. Yeah. We're going to start talking about the cell and what but it But I does. had a question for you because you did say it at one point and I thought, oh, should I jump in here or let you go? And <laughs> I 
You um, let me go. Smart let, decision. Because I always get criticised for stopping you. Fairly, yes. So why would there be organelles that have their own membrane? So oh, yeah. Why? Okay, I get the point that a cell has a membrane that wraps it up for protection yep. to allow th- it's kind of selectively permeable, yep. which allows some things in and some things can't get in and out and so forth. Yep. But why would you do it for... You've sp- answered the question. Specific <laughs> You've organelles. answered the question. You just defined why we need membranes because they separate what's happening inside something to outside and they're selectively permeable so they can allow certain things to remain in and allow certain things but to... But why would that be bad once life? you're in the cell, though? Why would that be bad? Yeah. What do you mean? So why would you want to um, separate, segregate? Well, the cell is, compared to all the machinery inside of it, yeah. is enormous, just like a university and a student, right? So if, for example, I said uh, all the learning, all your education, so the, the library, right, with the books, if I said there's no library, we just scatter the books amongst the campus. Yep, yep. <laughs> right? Yep. That's not going to be very helpful or efficient for the student. Okay, right? okay. And the same thing goes with there's no classrooms. You just have to find randomly okay. where your professor is. So it's to concentrate it. Yes, it's so okay. that so that it, there is a, defi- <clears throat> a defined location for things to occur. And once you're there, the, the machinery that's required, whether it's machinery for detoxification or lipid synthesis, synthesis or post-translational modification, it's in the place that it needs to be for it okay. to occur. Okay, so it's locational convenience. Correct. But could it also be... Well, there's also pH differences, yeah, that's good. enzymes and things yeah. that can damage and affect. So a good example of that is the lysosome. So if yeah. you were just to release that into the cell, which is sometimes either... This is sometimes part of apoptosis. Oh yeah. So when the when the trees fall when the uh, leaves fall off the trees in autumn. No, I mean, well, kind that's of. That's the definition of apoptosis. But I just mean if you wanted to if the cell needs to be killed, yeah. It could just release lysosomal enzymes within its own self. Yes. Or even the smooth ER which is sometimes full of calcium will just release the calcium intracellularly. Yeah. And that leads to that apoptosis process. Yes. So if you were to not have that, then the cells necessarily wouldn't function well. Self-destruct. Now, just before we move on to the specifics, I've got some a few other figures for you. All right. When you look at this university, which is a cell, yep. um, what, what percentage of it do you think are the campus grounds? So this is, what is this part of the cell? Uh, cytoplasm. Yeah. Yep. So what percentage of the cell is cytoplasm? Oh, okay. Um, well, f- cells are three-dimensional. Uh, so the, they're a lot – because it's like a, a ball or a round-ish. Now, I should say that this – huge volume inside. This, this one I'm reading yeah. is just from a hepatocyte. So okay. it's not necessarily a true cell. Oh, okay. How do you? Um, do you know what I mean, though? Like uh, if okay. you, this wouldn't work for, as a red blood cell All right. or uh, a look, bone cell. I'll, I would say uh, 99.9%. No, only 54%. What? Yeah, 54% of a liver cell. Yeah. Is cytoplasm. What's the rest? Oh, all the organelles now. But the cytoplasm is the organelles. Did you mean cytosol? Cytosol. You yeah. son Didn't of I say a... cytosol? You said cytoplasm. Okay, all right. Because I thought you meant everything no, inside. Sorry. Oh, okay. 54%. Well, I would have said and that. Technically That's there's... exactly what I would have said. And there's technically only one of them. <laughs> so one of what? One cytosol. Zol. One yes. cytosol. Oh, cytosol is just fluid. That's right. That's okay. right. Let, so what, what's, your, going, man. what's your next organelle? Send me out for well, go, let's go to the library. Well, no, what no. percentage of the university oh. campus is a library? Okay, is just let me just clarify, just in case you're mixing your terms. Are you saying the volume inside of the nucleus? Mm. What percentage? What, what does volume that is make the up for the total? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, I would say five, five to ten percent. Yeah, six percent. Okay, Good okay, work. not bad, not bad. Now, generally speaking, there's only one nucleus in most cells, right? Yeah, but not all. Some but not muscle all. cells have, like uh, skeletal yeah. muscle, have yeah. multiple because yeah. that's important for them to grow and divide. Yep. Yeah. So um, next organelle. Okay, uh, mitochondria. Okay, what percentage? <sighs> Depends on the cell. That's right. Because if it's we're, a cardiac we're, we're, we're a liver cell, cell here. Oh, liver cell. Because I know a cardiac muscle cell, because I'm delivering this next week. Has the most? 30%. Yeah, yeah. 30% of its mass, or sorry, well, this 30% is gonna, of its volume is mitochondria. Well, so it's going to be less than that. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, 22%. 
Yep. Okay. I'm doing Okay. Well. So that's percentage. All right. So what about number then? Just because most of these are going to be one. You only have one of these. Oh, yeah. But, but what about mitochondria? mitochondria? Yeah, because they're, they're basically... So let's go a, cardiac cell. How many mitochondria in a cardiac muscle cell? Okay, they're relatively when big I, muscle cells. when I looked into this earlier this morning, I'd probably the say, cardiac myocyte appears to have the most mitochondria out of any cell type. Yeah, I'd probably say each cardiac muscle cell has... Oh, I don't want to go too big. Let's say uh, 500 million... No, no, no one. Okay, no. that's too big then. Uh, I did that on purpose just to <laughs> test you. One million. Not even close. Okay. It's a couple of thousands. Twenty. A couple of thousands. Okay. Mitochondria per cell. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's that's less than I thought. So mitochondria so for a, a hepatocyte. A little bit. Yeah, way. It's silly. Silly guess. <laughs> mitochondria and hepatocytes fifteen hundred. Or so it's fifteen to seventeen hundred. Right, okay. Uh any other interest? No, let's let's leave it there. All right. Is there anything else you want to just by number? No, or, unless you've got something interesting that you want to say. Oh, I can keep going. All right, I, let's I go. Think let's go. What about okay. Golgi? Golgi, kind of they've put that in with the rough. Okay. so And that's about 10%. Okay. That makes sense. But there would be more in the – so we're talking liver here. Liver. Yeah, liver's going to have more of the smooth endoplasmic yeah. reticulum. So about 6% yeah. smooth. Yes. Wow. But 10% for both rough and yeah. – Golgi. Golgi yep. Yeah, makes sense, makes sense. Uh, all right. And then you have the the ones that kind of would be for clean up and landscaping. So that would be the endosomes, the really? lysosomes, the peroxisomes. peroxisomes. All right. They would... Tiny, 1%. Small yeah. in volume but a lot in number. Oh, like, yeah, so okay. So in the hundreds, sense. in the hundreds. All right, but they make up what percentage? Yeah, 1% each. Oh, okay. Yeah, makes sense. Well, there you go. Thank you. No, that's good because I think it gives people a, a mental image as to the quantity, volume, number, you know, all that type of stuff. All right. I want to start with the cell Library. membrane. No, the cell membrane. Oh, the cell membrane. Because we're to talk about how okay. do we even construct a cell, right? Uh, and we need to let everyone know that the cell is comprised of a phospholipid bilayer, right? And so the phospholipid bilayer is this double membrane structure. Yeah. Uh, made up of pretty much phospholipids. Uh, now, phospholipids... And the membrane is both water-liking and water-hating. Very true. So what's the term for that? Uh, hydrophobic <laughs> no, for no, water. Meaning both. Oh, uh, amphipath- uh, amph- 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 amphipathic. Yeah. Amphipathic. Which like comes from amphibian, which can means to do both. Oh, I didn't even think about that. So, yeah, amphipathic. There we go. I did brought an animal... Th- Thing into you it. Thank you. Very You're welcome. Good. You're welcome. Um, all right. So it's we've got phospholipids, right? So if you draw a phospholipid up, it's got this head, this circular head, and these two tails. So the head is the phosphate, right? And the tails are going to be this uh, fatty acid tail. Right? So f- phosphate and glycerol, would you? That's kind of the head and neck. Yes. And then the yeah. tails being the fatty acid. Correct. And so if you think about it, phosphate is charged. So phosphate is pretty much, uh, we've got phosphorus, right, which is an, uh, at- an element on the periodic table surrounded by oxygen. And the oxygen has a whole bunch of, there's a number of oxygen surrounding this phosphate and they're negatively charged. That's the head. So phosphate head, negatively charged. And in biology, you need to remember that if something has a charge associated with it, it's going to love to interact with water. Okay. Because water being H2O... Two it's hydrogen, charged. one oxygen. The hydrogen is slightly positively charged. The oxygen is slightly negatively charged. So it loves to interact with positive and negatively charged things. So can we call that polar now? You can pull, call it polar, yeah. And that's going to be important a little bit soon yeah. when we talk about what can go through the membrane. Yes, yes. So polar substances are going to love water. A couple so of charged substances. Yeah. So it's about 7 to 10 nanometers thick. What is the cell membrane. Okay. But okay. wait, wait, wait. Before we get to that, because we need to talk about how many phospholipids make up the membrane, right? What, in total? Just, okay. Uh, oh, I, you mean just the thickness of it? Well, we haven't finished with a phospholipid. I just spoke okay. about the head, right? <laughs> the right. tail is now... So they kind of look like a two-tailed sperm or yeah, tadpole. The, the, we'll say tadpole, right? Okay. Because the sperm's another cell. Yeah. So let's do... It's got a phosphate head. It's charged. The tail, fatty acids. So fat. Just think mm-hmm. fat. A double fatty acid tail, fat loves fat, fat doesn't love water. So the tail is hydrophobic, the head loves water, hydrophilic. So if you've got this one molecule of something where one part of it wants to be around water but the other one doesn't, 
Keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. If I were to then fill a bucket up with all of these molecules and pour that bucket into a swimming pool, mm-hmm. what's going to happen is that all of those polar heads, those hydrophilic phosphate heads, want to be exposed to the water. But the tails, the fatty acid tails, they want to be as far away from the water as possible. What? How can they arrange themselves in a way in which the head is exposed to the water and the tail is not? Well, you bring two tails together and leave the heads on the outside and the two tails come together. But then you go, but the sides of the tail are going to be exposed to the water. Okay, then let's So it's a bit put- like, you know, when you see those action movies where there's a, a group of heroes and they're fighting a huge army, they have to kind of back onto each other. They've got their backs to each other in a big circle. That's right. And the That's right. inner part of that circle is hydrophobic yep. and they're facing outwards, which is the, the water component or the phospholipid, oh, so the, the phosphate head. Yes. So what you end up having is as the fatty acid tails come together, they then join. So you've now got two of these molecules together. You then have another one come together and another one come together, another one, and they all connect where the fatty acid tails are side by side and they form this big circle. And now what you have is the fatty acid tails are only exposed to other fatty acid tails yeah. and the hydrophilic heads are exposed to water on the inside of this structure and on the outside of this structure. So now what we've got is a membrane-bound structure with fluid inside and fluid outside and the right uh, parts of the molecule are exposed to the right thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. So it's my point in saying this is it spontaneously forms. So you don't need this creative design to create a, a, a cell membrane. It will spontaneously form because it's the most efficient structure to be made yep. in this solution. But saying that, there are organelles within the cell yep. that's job, and I think the smooth ER is one of them, that have to constantly kind of repair the cell membrane by sending up these kind of phospholipid yes. to continually keep the perimeter of the university exactly right. Exactly intact. Right. Yeah, so, you know, once the walls of the university are made, you don't keep those builders there forever, right? So, and I fully concede that you don't just take a dump truck with bricks and just tip it yeah, yeah. into the site, into the grounds and then it f- spontaneously forms a perimeter. Yeah. But you do need, like you say, groundskeepers or somebody there to maintain the integrity of it and that's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum because it synthesises fat-soluble fat products uh, like phospholipids and we'll get back to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum shortly, but it, to maintain it. Yep. Now, the thing about this layer, how thick did you say the phospholipid? So it, we call it a bilayer because yeah. there's two phospholipids together, right? So how thick is it? 7 to 10 nanometers. Nanometers. Yeah. So remember, a red blood cell is about 7 to 10 micrometers, so a 1,000 times bigger. Yeah. So a red, and it makes sense because a red blood cell has this, phospholipid yeah. bilayer around it. And actually an example I'm going to use for a cell that its function is highly dependent on the cell membrane yep. is a red blood cell. Oh, okay. You want to do that now? I can do it now if you want. So a red blood cell um, is shaped, what's it shaped like? Like a donut. A donut but without the hole. Yes. So it's, it's like a, it's a disc. Yeah. And you put your thumb imprint into the middle. So of it. by a concave discocyte. Oh, okay, yeah. That, that, so everyone <laughs> knows now. Everyone's got that bioconcave discocyte. Yeah, stuck so, in their head. So a red blood cell yeah. is about eight microns in length, mm-hmm. and in thickness, it's about two microns. Yeah. Okay. Now it's not like a a dinner plate. It kind of caves in in the middle, but doesn't yeah. create a hole. Yeah. Now this shape is highly important because it needs to almost uh, squeeze in half. It can fold Fold itself. in half yeah. to fit down the small capillaries. Yes. Now, if it loses its ability to do this, it won't be able to perform that function anymore. You know, that's not the only reason why it's that shape. Do you know the other reason? Well, it's, it's also got a very high surface area to volume ratio, yeah. which means it has a great capacity to exchange, diffuse... Well, it's got a great... It's greatest, gases in it, and out. Well, uh, yes. Think about, okay, if the red blood cell was a ball, yeah. right? Which is where I'm going to get to the disease of it. So if a red blood cell 
because of its cell membrane, loses its ability to hold its patency of that shape, shape and becomes a ball, mm. which is called spherocytosis, yep. then it becomes problematic. And yes. it can still obviously diffuse... It's oxygen and carbon dioxide, but it becomes inefficient and probably gets killed off early. Okay, so think about this. And then hence a form of anemia. And the, and the reason why is because if you've got a ball perfectly circular and you were to fill it with oxygen, the only oxygen that would get exchanged On the outside. is the oxygen closest to the yeah. wall of the ball. Yeah. The oxygen deep in the middle has got too far to diffuse. But if you then take this ball and you squish it like a red blood cell, regardless of where it's where the oxygen sits in the red blood cell, it's the same distance mm-hmm. to the surface or the membrane, right? So it's not just the fact that this shape allows for it to be flexible, but it also allows for gas diffusion to occur most efficiently. Which is it's, it's a function. beautiful structure. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes I refer to your body shape being a red this, blood cell. Uh, Bioconcave. I'll take that as a compliment. Site. That's so, what your wife says. So certain proteins. That, that bioconcave discocyte. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that proteins within, just underneath the cell membrane of the red blood cell, but also associating with proteins in the red blood cell, which we haven't got to yet. No. Uh, so the proteins in the cell membrane of the red blood cell. If you have problems, and I think it's called spectrum. I think that's what it's called. Spectrum. Um, spectin. Spectin. So. So that's the name of the protein. Spectrin. Spectrin. Okay, what does spectrin do? It's a protein? Yeah, it's a protein, but if in certain um, genetic... um, Disorders? Disorders, where there's a problem with the construction of this protein network, the red blood cell loses the ability to hold its biconcaveness. So shouldn't you... And then it becomes more spherical. So this is uh, cytoskeletal architecture. Yeah, but it's also associated with the membrane itself because what we haven't discussed is that probably in terms of the composition of a, of a plasma membrane, the vast majority of it in terms of component is protein. Yes. So more of the cell membrane is protein than it is actually phospholipid. Yes, and that makes it quite rigid. Yeah. And so what the cell membrane needs to do is implant uh, cholesterol yep. within it to help maintain Fluid, fluidity. Fluidity, yes. So, so either not too much, yes. but not enough. Yeah, it can't be so fluid that, it that pulls apart. when it's in contact with other lipid-soluble substances, it just merges and pulls apart like you said. And I think also with temperature though, right? If, if you get too yes. hot, the membrane will start pulling apart yep. and then you might have um, transport issues, like things can cross it maybe easier. And it shouldn't. And if you get too cold... It becomes too contractile, just like putting the fat in the fridge. Yeah, it, it gets solid. That's right. And so the cholesterol in there makes it fluid. Yes. So that's important. So, in embedded in this plasma membrane, we have proteins and we have cholesterol. Um, so about so about thirteen percent of the cell membrane is cholesterol. Yes, and and simply that cholesterol is basically just there for the fluidity, but the protein is there. One, for, for structural many, integrity, but many also functions. it can be receptors, they can be transporters, they can do a whole bunch of things, yeah. right? And that's goes signaling to, molecules. So that then goes to the function of the plasma membrane with a red blood cell. Yep. You have these proteins that are probably, I don't know if they're in, in teg, is it integral, which yeah, means integral. Goes, goes through the whole length of it. That's right. They may just be on the, oh, I think they're integral, that sits within the membrane but also um, communicates with proteins underneath it, so in the intracellular side, yeah. that allows for the membrane of a red blood cells to be held in that bioconcave manner. Yeah. Now, it's important to note that this would be my assumption here. Proteins, how are they made in a cell? Proteins are made uh, because DNA within the nucleus is transcribed into RNA, leaves the nucleus, and then is translated from RNA into proteins by ribosomes. Yes. And they're either now, free-floating ribosomes or ribosomes in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Right. So the red blood cell doesn't have any of these. Right. So, so it can't make new proteins. Correct. So these proteins yes. that we just spoke about. They're there for life. They're there for life, but they're going to... The life of the red blood cell. They're going to start to run out yep. on quality, right? Sure. So Because as it's been used to carry oxygen and release oxygen and carry carbon dioxide and release carbon dioxide... It's so as to, a red blood cell ages, yep. it loses its ability to hold its bioconcaveness. Yeah, so or bioconcavity, you could so simply it say. it becomes um, a bit like what I spoke about 
Sphero shaped. Yes. And so it starts to become that happens worn out. At around about 120 days. And then it is subjected to a personal destruction. A personal trainer. Oh. Yep. Which the spleen. It, mostly the spleen, the but the liver can do it. And the kidneys to a degree. And if it can't pass through that um I don't know mesh work. The, the ninja oh, warrior yes. um course. Yep. The macrophages just kill it. Right. So if I was watching Ninja Warrior and they were climbing up the wall and they fell into the water... They get killed. Yeah, they get killed. Yeah. Wow. Macrophage just slices it in half. The sharks in that water. Yeah, that's right. Recycles it. There's yeah. a separate podcast, but just pulls it apart, yeah. sends the important components to make more. Um, but the take-home point is red blood cells have a fairly short life. If you want to listen to more of that, <laughs> we've got a, an episode on the YouTube... We've got a video on the YouTube channel on Billy Rubin Metabolism. We've also got a podcast on bilirubin metabolism as well. But let's get back to the cell membrane, okay? Now, the cell membrane is a semi-permeable membrane. It will only allow certain things through. Generally speaking, I say to my students that if it's large or charged, it ain't getting through. Now, large is, well, it's subjective. Just in size. Yes, but it's subjective, right? So, what? I mean, I could say that you're large and I'm not large. To a cell, we're both large. But... You know, to Thor Bjornsson, the world's strongest man, you're not large. That's true. So what is large? Uh, so when we're talking about the size of things uh, that can get through the cell, it's basically talking about just proteins and cell. The things that are the size of proteins and cells generally can, and, and mole- mostly molecules can't get through. But would they be more to do with the... Do you think that's the size or maybe the charge of it? Uh, well, so like, say, glucose. Yes. Is it the size or is it, does it have a charge that repels? That's a good question. When it comes to glucose, I think it's the size. Uh, no. Because you could have structures that are fat-soluble. Yes. Like, no, it's, I like think, vitamins, fat-soluble vitamins. Yes. That can, or some, some hormones that can slide through the cell. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I'm going to check into that. Okay. Now, but... When it comes to charged, what we're referring to here is that like anything that has a positive or negative. So an ion being a charged atom or element isn't large no, by definition. And so it could go through in accordance to its size, but because it's got a charge, it's okay for the phosphate heads. They're like, yeah, come in, come in, come in. But then once it gets to the fatty tail, they're like, what the hell are you doing here? We don't like charges. Get the hell out. Yeah. So it repels it. Um, when it comes to glucose, it's the size. Okay. Right? Um, now, when it comes to uh, what size doesn't the membrane let through, I'll let you know that in one <laughs> second. Um, so do you, do you want to go through the things that can get through? Yes. All right. So the things that can get through a plasma membrane, yep. firstly, there's not really an order to it, but I'll just build. 500 Daltons. The okay. membrane doesn't let molecules larger than 500 Daltons through. Okay. I don't know what a Dalton is in terms of scale. Okay. Is it just like size? Like it's not like a length measurement. No, no, it's a chemical structure measurement. But keep going. So the things that can go through the membrane very easily is like small things. Yep. Good example would be oxygen, carbon dioxide. So gases. Gases. Yeah. Then we can have... Still small molecules, but it's a bit harder to get through. Not as It doesn't diffuse as easily as... One Dalton, just to interrupt, yeah. is approximately equal to the mass of one proton, which is a hydrogen ion, right? Okay. So it's about the mass of a hydrogen ion. So 500 Daltons, it's pretty large, can't get through. There you go. Okay. Um, so a small... A sm- actually, the small polar molecule can get through, yep. being water. Yeah. So water can squeeze its way through a cell membrane. But we think it's through channels, not though, right? No, wait. It can get through, yeah. but it's very slow. Okay. Now, where you have cells that really need to push water through quickly, yep. that's where you have the aquaporins. Okay. Which so like kidney, water holes. kidney yep. as an example. Or um, I'm not sure about the small intestines because that then comes to... I think it's aquaporins. What I was going to talk about later but I can do it here. When we talk about water absorption from your small intestines where a lot of it would occur, um, free water absorption is not overly 
effective on its own. Yeah. But if you have other molecules that are crossing the membrane, mm. it can bring water with it. And that's where... Through osmosis. That's the idea of having a isotonic fluid opposed to a hypotonic fluid. It's also how diarrhea works, osmotic diarrhea. It's the opposite. Yes. Yeah. If you've got... If you're ingesting a whole bunch of milk proteins that you can't digest, so you're lactose intolerant, proteins are charged. So osmosis has gone the other way. So, so you've got all these charged things yeah. in the intestines and it's pulling water through. But, yeah, the intestines do have aquaporins, so probably works through those. I've also read previously that the water does move yeah, I think through it, cells but only through porins. Well, I, I think it I has still don't to, think I, they know. I think it has to because that's just osmosis, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it has to move through, but it's yeah. just not overly quick. The other thing about – oh, do you have something else about membrane? Um, no, I was, okay. just, I was just moving up the chain of oh, what can things go. that can – okay, yeah. keep going. Then we have large molecules, yeah. but they're nonpolar. Yeah. So this would be fat-soluble. So you could have yeah. certain things that are quite large, but they can move through. And as I said, this like could steroids. be steroid hormones or vitamins, yeah. fat-soluble vitamins, they can cross. Then you go into – the bigger ones, like so, large and charged. Yes, and that, not happening. Glucose would be example. Yeah, and then you have all the charged stuff, which would be the ions. Yes, so you can have a large nonpolar molecule, so a large fat soluble molecule, it can get through, right? Because it doesn't have yeah. a charge. Yeah. Um, and it's like, okay, let's do it. Let's move our way through. And then those steroids. That's how they work. They have to get into the cell to work, right? Steroids work by changing transcription, so they need to get to the nucleus. Yeah. So they don't just have to move through one. Uh, membrane. They're going to move through another membrane because the nucleus also has well. a membrane. And we'll get there in a second. Another important point we need to understand about membranes is that all the cells of the body have a charge difference across their membranes. That's super important. So you've got these, you've got uh, uh, dissolved in the extracellular fluid outside the cell and the intracellular fluid substances, solutes, and a number of these solutes have charges. And these are mostly ions, sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, chloride, and so forth. But there's also proteins as well. Now, you've got different numbers and quantities inside and outside. And the reason why is because there are pumps that establish this gradient. Mm -hmm. So one important pump embedded in the across the membrane of every cell of our body is the sodium potassium ATPase pump, where it uses... ATP, which is energy, and throws three positive sodium outside the cell and two positive potassium inside the cell, Estab establishing a gradient, a concentration gradient of chemicals with most sodium outside, most potassium inside, but also a charge gradient where there's three positive things outside, two positive things inside. In addition to that, you've got other channels and other pumps that continue to establish gradients and charge uh, chemical and charge gradients, establishing a charge difference across that membrane. So just outside the cell of the cells of our body, it's slightly more positive compared to the inside. And this is what we call the resting membrane potential. And the re why do you think this is important? Why do we need, why do the cells of our body need to have a charge difference? So is it all cells or just no, it's the all excitable cells. cells? It's all cells. It's just the excitable cells have leveraged this charge okay. difference for significant functional benefit. Okay, because I thought that in some ways cells generally like to keep the charge pretty much the same, so electrostatic charge. They try to. What's out, what's in. But all cells have a sodium-potassium pump. Mm. So they will all... Now, the resting membrane potential is going to be different for different cells, right? Uh, the excitable cells are going to have relatively significant resting membrane potentials because the whole purpose of it for them... Now, an excitable cell is a cell that has the capacity to do something. Muscles have the capacity to contract. Neurons have the capacity to communicate. Endocrine cells have the capacity to release chemicals. So at rest, they don't do any of those things. But there's a charge difference. Mm. And if you change that charge difference... So, for example, I said the outside of the membrane is slightly positive and the inside's slightly negative compared to the outside. If you make that inside more positive by throwing sodium in or calcium in or magnesium in, but mostly sodium and calcium, you've now triggered a difference. And that difference can lead to a whole range of intracellular changes, mm -hmm. which can either tell a muscle to contract, tell a neuron to send a signal, or tell a hormone, uh, sorry, or tell a gland like, let's say, the pancreatic beta cells to release insulin. Yeah. And so that's really important why they've established these charge differences. 
So that's important. Yeah. And it's it, it's amazing because it, it's a charge, right? And we, because we've got 30 trillion cells or let's say 36 trillion cells, all with quite large surface areas or membrane areas, we have 30 million volts per metre of electrical charge of, in our body. Seems like, that sounds like a, a that's lot. That's a lightning bolt yeah. per metre. So we have a lightning bolt's worth of charge established across our body or across the membranes of the cells of our body. One lightning bolt per metre. Yeah, wow. Isn't that insane? Yeah, I'm sure some animals have utilised that for their own benefit like eels. Zapping. Yeah. Yes, yes. Zap. So uh, anything else about membranes? Oh, look, the only thing I want to say, be- but I don't want to get caught in the depth of this because yeah. we, I'm pretty sure we've done this in some shape or form before, is just the different ways that things can transport across. Yeah. But generally speaking, you have things that can just diffuse across. Yeah. Therefore, they're just following their concentration gradient from yep. high to low. But then you can have proteins, which are generally going to be carriers, which could be either just a, a portal that opens, mm-hmm. like um, an aquaporin, yep. or more of a channel which kind of changes shape to facilitate the movement. So you might have, so an example, again, let's go to the small intestine, where you may want to transport sodium or glucose across the cell, mm. um, so from the intestine lumen side through the cell into the blood. Yep. Um, it ha- to do that movement, it has to have this protein that kind of changes shape and grabs the sodium and glucose and pulls it across, mm. and that would be ca- called a facilitated diffusion. Yep. So it's still diffusion, still going from a high to a low, but it needs help from a protein to move it across the membrane. And then you have um, pumps, which is moving across the membrane, but against the gradient. And example you gave was the ATPA's pump. Mm -hmm. So it needs energy to do this. So it's moving it against its gradient. So you're actually pushing sodium out of the cell or potassium in, and that's going against where the majority is. And then you can go to the big transports, where you're bringing huge amounts of things into a cell, and that's generally referred to as endocytosis, which can be mediated through receptors or kind of just pinching off a whole bit of membrane and pulling it in like an endosome, and that's obviously requiring energy because it's such a big process, Mm. or the opposite where you are pushing it out. But that's transport. That's exocytosis. So these are different uh, transport methods that the membrane can use Mm to bring things across it, um, but it's important to note that these you have differences like diffusion, diffusion but with facilitation, and yeah. then you have... So basically membrane transport can be passive, requires no energy, and it's going to get... It, whatever the substance is will get across by going down its concentration gradient. Either it does it th- directly through the membrane or it does it using something to help it, like a channel, for example. Or if it goes against or up its concentration gradient... It's active transport and requires energy, and that could be energy in the form of ATP or energy in the form of hijacking some other substance going yeah, down its and own and concentration. And the intestine gradient. is a good example. So when you're using facilitated diffusion and you're putting glucose and sodium across the cell, water can jump on board with it yeah. and get a free ride, and that's a good example of how you can hydrate in the small intestines more efficiently, and that's where you see things like the sports drinks or the hydrolytes, yes. which they use electrolytes to do the movement yeah. to bring the water more efficiently across the membrane. Yes. All right, so that's the membrane. The only thing I'll add, sure, just as an... Well, you basically said it. Yeah. Another cell that really needs its membrane to work as a function is, like you mentioned, the neurons or the muscles, mm. which is highly dependent on you changing the electrochemical charge. Yeah for it to do its job. Yeah. And so a neuron, the long process, which we call the axon, is just membrane and it just sends that electrochemical charge difference down the membrane, which is basically being used for a signal. Yes, that's right. That's right. All right. So that's the membrane done. So we go into the cell now. So we have diffused into the cell. So we're going down our concentration gradient through the membrane into the cell. Let's first start with the nucleus. So this is the library, is it? This is the library. So the, the nucleus is uh, a really important site. 
Uh, well, let's first just talk about, let's just quickly talk about the nucleus itself, right? Evolution on Earth has been punctuated by a couple of, like, very special events. So, like, uh, going from water to land or developing wings, the evolution of wings, right? Probably the most important thing to happen in evolution is the, evol- is the evolution of a nucleus. Mm. And this is so important, right, because if you look at the organisational hierarchy of life, do you remember how it's categorised, the hierarchy of life? It starts with domain. Mm-hmm. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, species. family. Sorry, this microphone's not picking up my family. Family, genus, species, right? right? Domain's the first one. It's the, the top when it comes to the hierarchy of life. It's the way we broadly classify all of life. And when we look at it, we pretty much break it up into whether something does have a nucleus or doesn't. If it does have a nucleus, we call it eukaryotic. What's the you mean? Good. Okay, so and good carry carry is obviously chromosome. Is that nut or something? It's nut. Nut. So it means good nut. <laughs> <laughs> so eukaryotic means good nut, and prokaryotic means before nut. Before nut. Right. The nut is referring to the nucleus. So, so obviously, it's important to note here that prokaryotic cells, like a bacteria, yep. although they don't, they don't have a nucleus, they still have DNA. They do. Or RNA. Like but, bacteria. But they um, don't have a a nucleus, so an organelle just for that. Like, That's right. Like eukaryotic cells do. Yeah, so bacteria don't have a nucleus. They're prokaryotic, uh, but their DNA is also different. It's circular, mm. um, unlike ours, which is linear. We'll get to that in a second. So the nucleus is a membrane-bound compartment within the cell, like we've spoken about, that contains the genetic material for the organisms. Um, now, if you look at a virus and a bacteria that genetic material is sort of just like left all over the place, right? like a teenager's bedroom. It's just sprawled all over the place. But that's fine because the cell itself is the whole organism, right? But for us, we've got 30 trillion of them. We need it to be efficient and effective. So we've chucked it into its own compartment to keep it. Is that also just the size of it as well? It's, the si- it's to keep it protected. It's to keep it localised because we're constantly transcribing, translating. Um, and but so would a bacteria, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, but a bacteria doesn't have as many genes as yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, and remember that each cell is going to transcribe DNA differently in our body. Yeah, sure. But bacteria is going to transcribe, translate the same. Probably itself constantly, right? That's right. Um, so the question is why would cells want to separate the genetic material out from the rest of it? And we, we spoke about that. Yeah. It helps regulate gene expression. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. Now... When in our evolution did we have, did we gain a nucleus? Right, it was about two point seven billion years ago. So a long time ago, but a very important thing. Um, so, how did we get a nucleus? Is the question, which a lot of we don't know the answer because we what's don't, the best hypothesis? Well, firstly, we don't have fossil evidence of a nucleus sure. of, of a nucleus because it's too small. Um, so of all the theories, uh, there's two main theories. There's the endosymbiotic theory and the uh, autogenous theory. So the endosymbiotic theory is that we basically just gained the nucleus from some other free-living cell or virus, similar to getting the mitochondria, right? Uh, autogenous is that we made it ourselves by, like, blebbing our cell membrane mm-hmm. Into you know you spoke about endocytosis yeah. like blebbing that cell membrane in and then it remained as its own thing and we just stuck the DNA in there. Okay. Uh, so there's nothing with like a p- pro nucleus. So there's no current organism that has kind of a oh, like intermediate. A, no, hmm. no, that's exactly right. So the nuclear membrane made up of the nuclear envelope. So that's again a double membrane yep. that encloses the whole organelle, similar to the phospholipid bilayer. Um, and it has pores. Now, it has around 3,000 to 4,000 of these uh, pores, and they can selectively transport molecules in and out. And the reason why these pores are important is because that's how we get the RNA. Right. Right? In and out. The mRNA. Is it in and out or just out? It's just out. Okay. Um, so but these- it, well, that, that's not true because we can have RNA come back in and uh, change the DNA. So it would be both in and, and out. what's the nucleolus? Yeah, so the nucleolus is an, another separate structure inside the nucleus 
uh, when you Google or even look up in textbooks its function, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, it does some stuff, but what? We're not really sure. Some regulation-based, st- like it regulates, but what it regulates we don't know. It's not much. Okay. Because I looked into the nucleolus. It's not, nothing to do with specifically ribosomes. The, con- the construction of rubber zones for the I think there was transcription process. I think there was something I read about ribosomes, but I can't remember mm. to be honest. Okay. But I, I do remember that. Uh, yeah, there's something to do with the ribosomes. So I've got a question for you. Yes. How many? So in the DNA, sorry, in the nucleus is the DNA. Yeah. Which is the code. Yep. That codes for things. Yeah. Cool. I know we usually say proteins, yep. but you're going to pull me up on that now because you'll say most of it doesn't. Yes. Um, but am I still – this is just something that I came across. Am we still safe by saying approximately the genes within your DNA would code for, you know, 10, 20,000 proteins? Oh, I'd say, like, I'd say far more than that. Okay. I'd say that we have about 20,000 genes, but those genes would encode for at least double the amount of proteins. Okay. So this is code in, code in genes, mm-hmm. but the but I came across something like one percent, one and a half percent are non-coding. So majority of our base pairs of DNA yep. don't do coding. Yeah, they used to call it junk DNA, yeah. and now I think they might call it dark DNA. dark DNA. So it's a bit like the dark matter of the universe. We don't really know. We know exactly. it's important, but we don't we know, know it's there. Yes. We don't know exactly. Now, so my question to you. Yeah. So. A number that I came across is our DNA, human DNA, is approximately 3.2 billion base pairs yes. of DNA. Yes. But then you could go to, say, a fruit fly, mm-hmm. which has, um, I don't know, 1,000 to 10,000 cells. Yep. So not many compared to our 36 trillion. But it has almost the same amount of coding genes. There you go. So it's interesting that so why... So you're thinking that the length of our DNA is equivalent to the complexity of the organism? No, not necessarily, but it's just interesting that we have this huge amount of just number, yeah. but we have almost the same genes of coding yeah. between a like a fruit fly and an organism. So well, the, the nucleotides are the same length, but they wouldn't have the same number of genes that... Right, that coding coding, coding genes. genes. Okay, I'm, I'm confident they wouldn't. Not quite as much, but they said that you know I'll share a lot of it. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we share something like 50 percent of our coding genes with bananas. Yeah. We so does that mean and just nothing like a banana? So does that just then mean that of the genes that we express, yes, we have very similar proteins that are made yeah. between us and a banana. Most proteins that our uh, that are transcribed and translated. Uh, regulatory for life, yeah, right? The rest are those that provide us the tweaks yeah. and I think that make us and, the individuals that we are. And I think that then becomes the dark DNA, right? Well, the it's, dark it's DNA... It's all doing this regulatory role, which not necessarily codes maybe. for a, a protein outcome, but it regulates the way that the gene is... Possibly, but the dark DNA could also have been useful... Once, once, and then just and not silenced. now, right? Because remember, if you've got, if you take your DNA, okay. So, the firstly, DNA is in the nucleus, three point two billion base pairs. So, base pairs are talking about the nucleotides that make up the DNA. So the, four. the alphabet. Yes, the A, C, G, and T: adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine. Right? They're the the flavors, the, the basically the letters of the alphabet that we use to code everything. Instead of twenty six letters of our English we've alphabet, four. there's four but it's enough to create a human being, right? So there is information stored in the combination of these nucleotides. So you've got 3.2 billion in this big, long stretch per cell, except our red blood cells, which we know make up 80%, 90% <laughs> of our body, right? But in every other cell. Now, they are very long. That's around about two metres long, 3.2 billion base pairs. Am I saying? So it's almost you. So it needs to be twisted and turned and compacted as tight as possible and we compact them into what we call chromosomes, and that's the way it sits until it needs to be uh, transcribed. And what are the or hair? Copied. What are the hair rollers that it rolls onto before it goes into a chromosome? Uh, well, uh, they're called histones. <laughs> so these are proteins that basically wrap it. I wouldn't call it hair roller because it makes it sound like the DNA is wrapped around the histones, but the histones are more so wrapped around 
the DNA. Okay. And so they're like clips that sort of hold it into place. But it really jams it in Oh, yeah. Well, it tightly. can jam two metres of DNA into a nucleus, which is minuscule, right? And so firstly that, the DNA is just like the books, right? Mm-hmm. It, there's information in there and it's stored in a leather-bound cover. That's DNA. So it's, it's kept safe, right? But if the DNA uh, isn't useful, it doesn't, you can't create proteins from DNA. Yeah, yeah. It needs to be transcribed and then translated. So transcribed from DNA into RNA, specifically mRNA. And this is which, done by the professors at the university. Um, well, uh, well the, going from RNA to proteins, yes, or RNA to amino acids, yes. But going from DNA to RNA, we need transcriptional machinery. So we need something that transcribes it into something that's more useful. Now, before we talk more about the, the DNA stuff that you had brought up, it's important to state that I want to ask you a question. Why don't we just have RNA, right? If ultimately oh, think, all we need is RNA, yeah. why don't we store all of our genetic material as RNA instead of DNA? My guess would be I'd, I'd attempt two things. RNA, well, you'd need a heap more because it would kind of... Probably um, not. You'd have to have it all like in small bits and you have to jam that in to fit into the cell. But you could have it, you could just have the DNA as RNA but packaged the same way. Okay, all right. So I'm going to dismiss that okay, theory. Right. I think the mRNA compared to the DNA is a lot less stable, so it would degrade quicker, so you wouldn't be able to retain it in there and you'd just lose it all the time. That's, that's the reason. That's exactly right. And I can give you a great example as someone who has done genetic research. If I take DNA and put it in a tube and leave it on my lab bench and I take RNA and leave it in a tube on the lab bench, that RNA, if I come back the next day, it's all disintegrated. It's gone. It's useless. Can't do anything with it. That DNA will stay for another couple of thousand years. Oh, wow. Right? So it's very stable. Extremely stable. Yeah. Now, not millions of years, hence why we can't get DNA from dinosaurs, but thousands of years because we can get DNA from dead organisms and, and humans from thousands of years. But RNA, it, it disintegrates immediately. Mm. All right. Now, we've got the DNA present. Now, you were asking about, I can't remember what you asked because I just went off on a tangent, but you were talking about 3.2 billion nucleotides. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. So the DNA... The, the smallest readable portion of DNA that can be translated into a protein is called a gene. But what happens is we have the transcribers that transcribe the DNA into the mRNA, but the thing is that they're going to transcribe a bunch of dark DNA, stuff that's useless, right? And that needs to be chopped out. And so they tend to be called, ironically, introns. So the things we take out are called introns. And exon, right? exons, say in. That's right. Whatever's remaining are the exons. So basically it's almost like, you know, you're copying from a textbook just like a student would and, you know, you've got this whole chapter that you're like, oh, I don't need to know the whole chapter. I just need the important parts. And so you do your study. The stuff in bold. And you basically just write, yeah, all the stuff that has been highlighted, mm. right, da, 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 and you chop out the stuff that you don't need. So the stuff chopped out, introns, the stuff that's kept, snapped together, exons, that's now your mRNA molecule. That's now exported out. Through those holes. Through, through the, those pores, those yeah. three to 4,000 pores. Uh, interestingly, one gene, and this is where I said to you, you know, you can have 20,000 genes but you can have far more proteins, yeah, yeah. right? Even though one gene trans- can transcribe one protein, the way that you read the gene and the way that the introns and exons are taken in and kept, uh, taken out or kept in can change the gene, okay? right? And so you can have one gene that's read different ways creating multiple proteins. Right, right. And that's common. Yep. Uh, that, hence why you can have more proteins compared to genes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so once you've got this mRNA molecule and it's been exported out, we need to do something with it. Mm-hmm. Is there any more you want to say about no. DNA or the nucleus? Let's, okay. Because we're, we're at, yeah, an hour and a half, half in. in. We've got a lot of organons to yep. get through. We're okay. So, so the mRNA now leaves the nucleus, yep. goes through those pores, yep. And now goes into the, well, you know, a lot of people would call the factory. Yep. In our analogy, it's the classroom. Yes, the now, rough endoplasmic The rough reticulum. ER, because the reason it's called rough is because it's got ribosomes embedded all the way through it. Yes, embedded in the membrane. Yep. Yep. So you then, can see them, so they're exposed. So now when, we, when this mRNA comes into the rough ER, yep. we are now translating. So we're changing form into 
Um, so from a RNA form into now a protein form or an amino acid form, right? Yes, that's right. And so the rough endoplasmic reticulum is the result of an invagination of the plasma membrane. Well, that's a theory that, that because it's another membrane-bound structure, right? Um, they think that the reason why the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum occurred was to maintain a constant surface area to volume ratio. So it's invaginated in and now we need to create more surface area for more things to happen, right? Um, now, these folds help translate that RNA to amino acids, like you said. Um, but it, it does other functions, which we'll get to in a second. So when we need to take that mRNA molecule, they bind to the ribosomes on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum and they can be taken inside to the lumen not always, but they can, uh, and they can. that's where translation can occur. But simply put, what happens is the ribosomes will take the mRNA molecule, which is now made up of those nucleotides, mm-hmm. A, C, G, and U, U. instead of a T, so yeah. a uracil instead of a thymine, and it reads them three at a time, which we call a codon, right? So it goes... So basically, when it reads A, C, U, that's a word, which means something, and the meaning is an amino acid. So it goes, oh, ACU, that means blah amino acid. And the ribosome goes and grabs it. Uses another RNA molecule, tRNA, to help stick an amino acid on. Then it reads the next three. Hey, let's recruit another amino acid, stick it on. And it creates this pearl necklace of amino acids that it's now created. Um, and so now this is what's happening inside the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You can now get modification. Happening, so the the rough endoplasmic reticulum can modify. Oh, does, this it he- does it here? Does it here? But the Golgi will also do it. Well, the Golgi is mostly packaging and putting a stamp on it, saying where it needs to go. Okay. But the rough endoplasmic it, it can do post translation really, modifications. Correct. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but really the Golgi yep. is just a continuation of the rough ER. Really. Exactly right. It's yeah. the same kind of cisterna uh, morphology, right? It exactly. kind of looks like the cisterna, which is. Just these folds on top of each other looks kind of like a a hot air balloon that's just deflated on itself. Yeah, it does. Mm. It, and I mean, and if you ever think about it, it's sort of like if you run a, a, a company that makes t-shirts, right? You've got the factory inside the company that makes the t-shirts. That's the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and then you've got the export department, which takes the t-shirts, chucks them in boxes, and puts a label in it saying this one's going to China, this one's going to mm. uh, you know Malaysia, whatever it may be, and that's going to be the Golgi apparatus. So once these proteins are, have been made within the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they're either going to be destined for export out of the cell or to be turned into an integral protein that you mentioned earlier that goes the full length of the membrane. So the whole purpose of the rough endoplasmic reticulum translating mRNA into proteins or amino acids that fold into proteins is for export, ultimately to get out of the cell or to go into the cell membrane. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's pretty much right. Yeah. So from my look into the Golgi, yeah. the Golgi will do some post-translational modification. Yes, and some can be similar to the rough, like, yeah. like glycosylation, for yeah, example. Glycosyl- so putting that's right. like sugar molecules onto yeah. it, which and are like stickers that say... And a really good go. example of that is mannose. That's right. That's a, a yeah, cup mannose, of sugar. Yeah. So mannose six phosphate. Yep. Let's just say that's a sticker. Yep. The Golgi can put that sticker on the protein, and that specifically becomes the enzymes for lysosomes. Yes, that's exactly. So that's right. a sticker that's specific for a lysosome enzyme. Yep. Which then will go across to a separate organelle bound organelle, which is the lysosomes. Yep. And they're just filled with those enzymes, which are the proteins. Yeah. But there are other. Other types of so we finished with Arafia, ER, and we kind yeah, of not got so. into the Golgi. Yeah, okay. No, we've, yeah, passed it to the Golgi. So you can have certain proteins that are made that are des- designed to be excreted as vesicles, exported, exported. All right, so these could be because it's not waste, right? True, true. So if you were a a beta, no wait. Yeah, a um, B cell, B cell, which is a like type of cell, white blood side. cell. Yep. They would have a lot of Golgi associated mm. with them. And what they're producing, particularly if they've differentiated by selection. And a lot of smooth and uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum because they need to make the... the yep. Are you talking about plasma cells specifically? Yeah, they become Making a plasma antibodies. cell. Uh, yeah. And so the antibodies, which are a protein, yep. 
uh, have been selected for to fit an antigen, which could be a microorganism or something else within the body. And it needs to start, and this is what plasma cells do as an immune cell, is just keep pumping out. They become antibody factories. Yeah. And so they just kind of group these antibodies that they've made in, package them up, and then just through exocytosis pump them out. And that because needs to have membrane kind of bound an energy, that's a process that the Golgi has to develop to kind of butt it off, push it out, and then it releases outside the cell. Yeah, so, so B cells, B lymphocytes, like you said, one of their offsprings are plasma cells and they're the antibody-creating ones. And you're saying they've got huge amounts of rough endoplasmic reticula and Golgi yeah. to make proteins and export proteins. Yeah. Right. Another, Makes so, sense. So then you can go... So that's the exocytotic vesicles that yeah. the Golgi plays a role with. Yep. But then you also have secretory, which are more like neurons. Yeah. So neurons would have Golgi that are associated with packaging or endo... Or, um, Hormone producing, what is it? Uh, what's the word? Endocrine. Endocrine, yeah. yeah. So like the beta cells in your pancreas, yep. they would also have Golgi. And yep. the Golgi is, instead of packaging them into endocytotic vesicles, yep. they are more packaging them into secretory vesicles. And their release, which is now in the beta cell, going to be insulin, that's dependent on a charge change, right? Yeah. Which then happens across the membrane of the beta cell, which is governed by glucose, which is going to change energy and potassium, and then I think finally calcium, which causes that vesicle to be secreted and then insulin goes into the blood. Yeah. But neurotransmitters work the same way, kind of held within the cell as a bundle, but when the signal has been given, then they'll get released out. So you're saying this is because the Golgi has been able to create these bundles? Is yeah. that what you're saying? So, the, so, the, so when it comes to something like acetylcholine ready to be released from a cholinergic neuron the vesicles that the neurotransmitter is sitting within at the axon terminal have been... Yeah, I'm not ex- I assume so, okay. but there's also a lot of acetylcholine that it can be just repackaged up after uptake. Do you think that repackaging is happening yeah, from I the don't Golgi? Know. don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But it, it would make sense, yep. right? Um, any uh, more about the uh, Golgi? The only other one which I mentioned is the lysosome. Oh, yeah. So they're producing those secretory enzymes and an example of a Golgi that has been modified for function would be the acrosome on a sperm. Mm. So they are the Golgi and they have um, kind of become specific to the function of that sperm, which is to create the proteins, the enzymes, that will ultimately eat through the out-of-egg oh, yeah. layers yep, yep, yep. To, to get through, to be able to then put the DNA mm. or genetic information into the egg itself. One thing I forgot to say about the nucleus, because you, you're talking about cells that have large amounts of or absent of, to highlight their function, right, of, of rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi, because you spoke about the B cells and the plasma cells having heaps, right, um, is that uh, you mentioned earlier that skeletal muscle have multiple nuclei, right, and generally a cell of a body will have one, but skeletal muscle have multiple. Yeah. And the reason why, which you spoke about earlier, is because the nucleus is ultimately responsible for the proteins that we make. And that skeletal muscle is just filled with proteins, specifically contractile proteins, actinomycin. Which is a top of cytoskeleton, which we'll get to. Yeah, which if you stress a muscle cell out by basically saying, hey, you need to contract more, contract more, contract more, so you're exposing it to a resistant force, resistance training, it's going to trigger the nucleus to go, I need to make more proteins. And if you do that a lot, you need to make a lot of proteins. So it would be beneficial for a skeletal muscle cell to have more nuclei. And that's what they do. They can be multinucleated, which is to the benefit of the muscle cell so it can create more contractile proteins, actinomycin. All right, so we've done uh, done nucleus, we've done rough endoplasmic reticulum, we've done Golgi. What about smooth endoplasmic reticulum? Should we start talking about that? So smooth uh, really is just a continuation of um, the rough in a way. It's not really necessarily a distinct organelle. The only difference really is its absent function. its absence of ribosomes. Yes. And changes its function yeah, significantly. Right. right. Yeah. So it then has certain functions where it can instead of the rough ER process in proteins, mm-hmm. the smooth ER processes lipids. And so yes. lipid synthesis which then can have a, a function within the cell. So these becomes 
maybe detoxification within hepatocytes. So they have those enzymes which are important for changing certain structures within um, molecules that the liver re- releases, or oh, sorry, receives. Mm-hmm. And we know that that's a function of the liver. Um, we know that within pharmacology, for instance, the, the pharma, pharmacokinetics so the way that the drug moves through the body, the metabolism of the drug, which usually means it's been turned off or to be excreted, is performed by enzymes within the liver. Yeah. And so a lot of that would probably take place in the in the smooth ER. Things like phase, I think phase two detoxification, yeah, me- phase two metabolism. So it's like, like cytochrome P450 enzymes yeah. and so forth. Yeah. yeah. And so by inhibiting those functions or speeding them up can change the way that the drugs are metabolised in your body. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, you said, so you said lipid synthesis and detoxification, two functions. Yeah, so, so a bit more on lipid synthesis. Well, so you can have cells that are pr- processing fats, yeah. um, which could be secretory cells. Yeah. So this could be in the gonads where you're producing things like androgens, testosterone. just need testosterone. to be mindful that lipids and fats are different, right? It's for, like lipids are fat-soluble and that we don't make... Uh, uh, lipid-based hormones from fats made from cholesterol, which isn't yeah, a fat, yeah, but lipid-soluble, yeah. but yeah, fat-soluble. Yeah, 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 so yeah. It just only because I, I have been corrected in the past before by people that they go, no, they're not fats, they're fat-soluble, okay. but they are lipids, and lipids include fats but also include cholesterol. Okay. And so it, 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 it synthesizes lipids, which allows for us to cover more. Basic. So the best term to use is lipids here? Lipids if you want to include cholesterol-based things like okay. hormones because a lot of the hormones are cholesterol-based. Okay, right. But not, they're not fatty acid-based, right? So st- cells within the gonads yep. that would be producing, so if it's the testes, yeah. these would be the... Um, Androgens. I'm just trying to think of the cell, not the Sertoli, but the... Um, Oh, uh, the sustentaculus. Oh, no. sorry. You're talking about the Leydig cells. Leydig cell. Yep, producing so testosterone. So my assumption would be that they would have a lot of smooth ER. Yep. And then within the um, adrenal cortex, yep. you're going to have also cells that produce um, lipid-based yep. uh, hormones. So they would also be important to, to mention. Yeah. But then there's a an interest in cell that has modified the smooth ER and that, again, we can go to muscle cells for this. Right. And this is more to do with calcium. Yes. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in muscle cell we call the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is well, if that, flesh. if that is specifically for skeletal or is cardiac... Cardiac also, as well, yeah. It's also called sarcoplasmic reticulum. reticulum. Yes, okay. that's right. right. Yeah. Um, and they hold calcium stores. So... The, most calcium is held extracellularly, right? But we hold calcium inside muscle cells as a quick pull because without calcium, muscles don't contract, right? Calcium is the key to unlock troponin so that now you've got the binding sites for actinomycin free, free and available. And if you've got ATP, contraction occurs. So it's, it's a storage for calcium, yep. right? And that's triggered by that charge difference across the membrane when that changes, so that depolarization. The typical cytotoxic concentration of calcium is about 100 nanomolar, right? So does that just mean if you have that amount in the cell, it will just trigger death? Death. Correct. Because apoptosis is a calcium-dependent process. It can be a calcium-dependent process, yeah. But the ER is far more than 100 nanomolar. It can be up to 800 nanomolar, right? Difference. That's... Oh, sorry... Micromolar. It can be so it can be so the toxic concentration in a cell, 100 nanomolar. The sarcoplasmic reticulum or endoplasmic reticulum, muscle cells can hold between 100 micromolar, so that's a thousand times more concentrated, to 800 micromolar, which is 8,000 times more concentrated. Wow. So it really is this pool, it's uh, which if it was just busted open would obviously trigger the cell to die, right? But is an important pool for calcium. And the reason why we need to hold that calcium again is for contraction, but also calcium waves or what we call calcium bursts or calcium pulses, super important for signaling. Yep. So, for example, heart muscle cell. So, okay, uh, skeletal muscle, the calcium that's required for its contraction all come from the sarcoplasmic mm-hmm. reticulum. Which is comes from a depolarization of the membrane anyway, right? Exactly. For cardiac muscle, it comes from both the sarcoplasmic reticulum 
and the extracellular fluid, which is one of the reasons why there's a number of drugs that alter the way calcium influx happens for the heart, which mm-hmm. alters the way it contracts. Uh, however, in, in saying that, we need calcium pulses from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and cardiac muscle cell to help with the depolarization events for the action potentials to occur in the nodal cells, so the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node. Uh, they're calcium they're more dependent. Because they're more neuronal? But they're calcium dependent. So neurons don't Ge- need calcium to send action potentials. But they generally do to release the neurotransmitter, that right? Correct. But for cardiac muscle cells, the action potential, at least for the nodal cells, the ones that set the pacemaker cells, uh, they're calcium dependent. So the depolarization event happens because of calcium. Okay, all right. Because of these bursts Rather and waves sodium. of calcium. So we need the sarcoplasmic reticulum there to, to throw these bursts of calcium out. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah. 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 Uh, and all we need is the influx of calcium in skeletal muscle for contraction. So it doesn't need to be ch- ch- like these, these timed bursts. Yeah, yeah. But it is needed for the heart. Um, anything else when it for comes the, to that? For the smooth ER? Uh, yes. I think from my... Estimation, it's really calcium yep. and lipid processing, which are the big roles that the smooth ER play. And detoxification in the yeah. liver. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So mitochondria is the last major one, isn't it, that we need to cover? I've got the ones to clean up. but Okay. Do them last? Do those last. To clean up the podcast? <laughs> so mitochondria are super important, right? So this is known as the powerhouse of the cell. Ask every first-year biology student, what's the mitochondria? And they'll say... It's the powerhouse of the cell produces ATP. And they say it in that way. Exactly like that because I don't care. I'm just sick of this course. Um, so, yes, powerhouse of the cell creates energy in the form of ATP, which Done. is adenosine triphosphate. does this via respiration, so it needs oxygen, um, and it's required for survival, right? Without a mitochondria, we dead. Um, but it doesn't just do that, so mitochondria... And pers- is it true Okay, the mitochondria yes. was a separate organism? Yes. It is. So it's likely that it originated as a uh, what's called an alpha proteobacteria, right? So an ancient bacteria. Um, and it developed this endosymbiotic relationship with an old archaean yep. cell. Which would be a, a prokaryotic? Yeah, so you've got... Archaea is just a pro, prokaryotic, yeah, like a so bacteria, Yeah, you right? basically got prokaryotic, eukaryotic, and archaic, right? So an... an an old archaic and a prokaryotic cell came together. One engulfed the other about two billion years ago. In an endosome. Well, it was endosymbiotic. It just engulfed it. It yeah. just the cell remained intact. And as far as we know, it only ever happened once in history. Wow. Just once. And it was so successful that we came out of that, that yeah. relationship, right? Well, in terms of the, the mitochondria, yeah. Well, the, we are related to the very first cell, the very first archaean cell that took in a proteobacteria. And the reason, so two billion years ago, right, the reason why this happened, we don't know, but we know that the relationship was, well, the proteobacteria will provide it energy and the archaea will provide it protection, right? And as time passed and, you know... And so to confirm that point, yes. if it was a separate organism it would have its own genetic material. It does, yeah. Mm. And so it, the like mitoc- bacteria is circular. So the mitochondria yep. has its own genetic information. Yep. It's double membraned, right? Yep. So when, when I say double membraned, I don't mean a bilayer. It's or two, two bilayers. It's got two bilayers. So an so outer and an inter. Inner membrane and an outer membrane and then an intermembrane space. So does that well. mean the outer is the original cell membrane of that organism that it came into? Don't know. Don't know if it always had it or it evolved two membranes over time. But it is important that it does have two membranes. Because some bacteria do have two cell membranes, like. True, because then they've got the... Ground negative, I think. Yes, because then they've they've got the... uh, What's the... That um, uh, ampicillin targets... The proteoglycans, they got the proteoglycan cell wall in between the membranes, right? And that's what the ampicillin targets to disintegrate. Anyway, that's not eukaryotic. So we've got a double membrane for the mitochondria, and that's important because the intermembrane space between the inner and the outer membrane is required because that's where we accumulate hydrogen ions that generate the pump for the ATP synthase that allows for the mitochondria to produce 
ATP. So that would that mean then bacteria that are similar to the mitochondria would still produce its energy that way? Bacteria produce its ATP in its membrane walls. Okay. So just like just our like mitochondria that. does. Just like that. So, yes, exactly right. So basically the mitochondria is a bacteria and it produces its, its ATP in a similar way to the bacteria. However, in saying that, you said that the mitochondria came with its own DNA. It did. Uh, but now I think it's only got something like, it only codes for like 13 proteins, the mitochondrial DNA. Um, I think the, the DNA is circular, like bacteria, made up of 16 kilobases, so 16,000 bases. We're made up of 3.2 billion, yeah. right? Uh, codes for 13 proteins, which are... Which are usually within its own cell, but yes, but our the rest of our genome can still produce proteins for the mitochondria, well, right? Well, that's the thing. The mitochondria over millennia has given us some of its genetic material. And so the, what those 13 proteins that it encodes, they're part of the respiratory chain, yeah. you know, the electron transport chain, the way it produces ATP. But it doesn't create all of them. Yeah. We need to create right, some right. that contribute as well, yeah, yeah. right? So it, it, it's core constituents are from complexes one to four of the respiratory chain, but we also need to create other aspects of those complexes. So would that be maybe more like the Krebs um, components? Like some of those other... Well, the uh, the enzymes associated yeah. with it, yes. Yes, that's exactly right. So we would we would encode all, well, most if not all of the enzymes for the Krebs cycle, which is a process that occurs inside the mitochondria. It's probably one of the most important processes mm. for all of life because it creates sugars, proteins, fats. So we can create all the things we need for building blocks mm-hmm. from the Krebs cycle and we can utilise those building blocks for energy in the Krebs cycle as well. That's how amazing the Krebs cycle is. Um, but, yeah, the main purpose of that mitochondria is ultimately to take the, uh, you know, the, the sugars, fats and proteins, mainly sugars and fats that we've ingested in our food, take the smallest breakdown product of it, so whether it be um, a, a fatty acid, a glycerol or a glucose, through various biochemical processes that mostly occur outside of the mitochondria, but they also occur inside the mitochondria, we strip those molecules of protons and electrons and then we hand the mitochondrial membrane those protons and electrons. The inner mitochondrial membrane plays hot potato with the electrons, which excites these protein complexes embedded in the inner membrane. And that allows for, that excitation allows for hydrogen or protons to get pumped into that intermembrane space. Now you've got a high concentration of protons there. So they're going to go so down. there's a gradient, there's a hydrogen gradient. They're going to go down their concentration gradient back into the, the middle of the mitochondria. And that generates a turbine that produces ATP. So the mitochondria are wind turbines or, yeah. um, they're, 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 or water they're, turbines. So, I, so this is the energy of the university. Yes, exactly right. Windmills and... Back to the university. <laughs> good, good job. Um, uh, so if you have a think about this, right, uh, mitochondrial myopathy. So one of the most common mitochondrial diseases, the reason why I want to bring this up is because it gives us a good indication as to how mitochondria work. Uh, you can have mutations in both mitochondrial DNA or nuclear DNA that can cause mitochondrial myopathy, okay. telling you how they both contribute mm-hmm. to respiration, so making ATP. Mitochondrial mutations are inherited maternally. Mm-hmm. Why? Well, most of, I'm not going to say exclusively, but it probably almost is, of the mitochondria that we have in our body comes from the ovum, which yep. is your mum. Excuse me? Your mother. Your mother? Oh, sorry, I thought we were offending each other. Um, Opposed to the the sperm. Yeah, which has very little mitochondria. But I did come across that you can get genetic abnormalities of the mitochondria that can be paternal as well. Yeah, I think... But it's minor, right? The dogma's never the case, right? Uh, If you have a mitochondrial myopathy, so the, the, the respiratory chain is buggered up in some way, the protein complexes aren't working, they're not transferring those electrons or pumping the protons properly... What do you think the symptoms are of these people with mitochondrial myopathies? Weakness. Yeah, weakness and exhaustion. Makes sense. They Mm. don't have any energy because they can't make it. So that's really important. Um, uh, So mitochondria. I'm just having a look. I've got so many notes on the mitochondria. It can trigger apoptotic events. So the mitochondria can trigger the cell to die. So 
When there's severe DNA damage to a cell or there's severe cell stress or infections or immune responses, so the cell itself is infected, yeah. um, or there's been a loss of signaling from surrounding cells or hormones or chemicals, uh, what the mitochondria can do is it can take cytochrome C, which is one of the proteins mm-hmm. embedded in the mitochondria, uh, and say, hey, just bugger off. Jump out of me and go into the cytoplasm. Right? Now, the cytochrome C is important because it helps carry those electrons. The reason why we've got all these proteins embedded in the mitochondria that play hot potato with electrons is electrons are extremely damaging. Nothing can right, hold them right. for a long period of time okay. because they get damaged. So one is will that hold like it. Oxidative stress or something. Yeah. So right. one protein complex will hold it, and then go can't hold it any longer. Your turn. Your turn. Your turn. Right. Until and and each time they do that, and they they hold onto it and they go ah, oh, and they pump protons. Right. Then they go. We need to give it some. Oh, let's give it to oxygen. And so the mitochondria hands the final electron to oxygen. That's why it's called the final electron acceptor. But at the same time. The protons that are getting pumped down to create the ATP are now present inside the mitochondria. We now snap the oxygen with the electron together with the hydrogen and we create water. And so water is a byproduct of ATP synthesis. Right. Anyway, that's a, that's a side point. So let's talk about it. It releases the cytochrome C due to stress um, from the intermembrane space. That's where it sits into the cytosol. And this begins a cascading event which triggers what we call the caspase family. I Do you remember that, that yeah. from undergraduate? So the caspase family, again, proteins, a multitude of proteins where you activate one, which then activates the next, it activates the next, and activates the next, which ultimately leads to the, the uh, demise of the cell. Basically disassembly from the inside. That's apoptosis. Right. So that's energy-dependent process. It is. And it's um, uh, a intentional process. Necrosis, so apoptosis means the leaves falling off the trees in autumn. So it's planned, it's programmed, right? And it happens from the inside out. And so it's, a that's contro- important. it's controlled because if you burst a cell, yep. because it's probably like what we mentioned at the start, you have all these organelles within the cell that yeah. are segregated themselves by their own membrane because they're full of harmful things. Yes, exactly. And if you burst this everywhere into the extracellular space, gonna it's going to damage it. all the other cells around it. Yep. And, and it's going to be this, necrosis. That's not necrosis. So it's going to be an ongoing process that's going to cause more damage and inflammation. Yes, yeah, so necrosis and apoptosis different. Apoptosis programmed, necrosis not. You know, apoptosis was coined by an Australian. Did you know that? Uh, John Kerr. And I remember when I was working as the an Prime undergraduate... Prime Minister of New Zealand? No, okay. different. Uh, th- yeah, anyway, I was going to make a joke. So uh, when I was... W- undergraduate, uh, and I was working in a hospital as a theatre technician, right? I remember one of the general surgeons there would tell me every week that, oh, yeah, I did my uh, training under John Kerr. Uh, he, he's the one that coined the term apoptosis. Did he really? Or it seems to me it's like a Latin term. It's long. It's Greek. Greek oh. term. No, no, he, he coined the term for that process. Okay. So he discovered the process of yeah, apoptosis yeah. and called it apoptosis, okay. program cell death. Right, right. Okay. But he was working, you know, back in the day when surgeons did like lab research. I mean, surgeons do be it care, now. Be careful what you say here. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to stop then. No, I'm not saying that. I was going to say anything, when surgeons did, did some real no, 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 important no, no. things. No, 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 I didn't <laughs> say that at all. Didn't say that at all. Um, anyway, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> Let's finally talk about the lysosomes <laughs> and the peroxisomes and then we've got listener male, Matt. Yeah. And then I think we've covered most of the cell. Okay, so lys- lysosomes we've already kind of alluded to. These are kind of enzymatic uh, endosomes. So yep. they're kind of these little bundles filled with um, really destructive enzymes. Okay. They've been labelled within the Golgi with that kind of um, mannose 6-phosphate label on them, which then destines to a part of the cell, which they are just sitting there for particular functions. Now, they work most effectively um, within a a lower pH. So the enzymes prefer to be, I think, acidic. That's right. And so what are they doing? These things are cleaning up. So they're going to be cleaning up products that are brought into the cell that might be damaging. Now, a good example of that, if you're a cell that eats things that are damaging, like... Uh, phagocytes, yeah. then you need to have a really good functional lysosome um, process. Oh, so if you're a phagocytic cell, like let's say a monocyte, 
who's turned into a macrophage yeah. once it's sort of uh, moved its way from the bloodstream into a damaged tissue that's been infected by bacteria and the macrophage has engulfed all of these bacteria. Now you've filled with bacterial products. You don't want them staying inside of you. Yeah. So you're going to have lysosomes in there that will take care of that. So do they? Do the lysosomes themselves? Because the lysosomes are sitting inside of the cell. Do they them? Do they engulf yeah, the products they, of what's inside the cell now? Correct. So as the it's like a babushka doll of things inside so, things. So as the endocytotic process occurs, yep. so as the cell engulfs a mass amount of things to bring it into the cell, it's now called an endosome. And it, when it first comes in the cell, it's called an early endosome. And it starts migrating deeper in the cell. Yep. So as it's migrating deeper, part of the job of the endosome is to make it more acidic. Right. Because that's going to be where the lysosome enzymes work more effectively. So as it's going deeper into the cell, it's going from an early to a late endosome. Yep. And it's got protein pumps on it to make the inside of the endosome more acidic. Right. So then the lysosome merges with it and just releases its enzymes, which work more effectively at an acidic pH and then breaks it all down. There you go. So this can be done with any cell that just brings in products through endocytosis. So that's important. Cells specifically that do phagocytic activities like neutrophils, macrophages. Um, an interesting point here, we've got a type of infection which is tuberculosis. Oh, yeah. Which is a bacillus. Oh, yeah. So that's bacteria. a top, top bacteria. Now, it has generated a effective method to stop the lysosome binding to the endosome. Right. So it becomes engulfed in a macrophage and stays there dormantly. Oh. And so it can't get killed. So that's why you can have these uh, tuberculosis, uh, yeah. active tuberculosis bacteria present within people for decades. Yes, right. So within liver, sorry, within lung or other locations in the body, it's kind of semi-engulfed mm. within macrophages that's dormant. Now, I think in some cases it can then become triggered, whether it's a, a drop in immune, I'm not quite sure, but then the infection can, can become more active. Because right. I remember that with cadaveric specimens but also um, taking bones from yeah, you know, people's I think, bones back right. in the day yeah. when you didn't know whether they had died of an infectious yeah. disease and if they died of tuberculosis you could still potentially... Get yeah, tuberculosis. That's right. That's yeah. right. So that's a function, but also an important other function that lysosome does is it does process to clean within the cell. Right. So this is termed autophagy, oh. and so warm the zumba of the of the cell. Rumba, rumba, zumba is the the, the, the thing that, the thing that you do on Tuesday nights. But <laughs> rumba, sorry, it's the rumba. <laughs> so autophagy is become a bit more of a um, topical. Oh God, that's not even bother because the potential because this is a catab catabolic yeah. process if you can arguably increase incre autophagy you're increase. increasing the body's ability to clean its own yeah. cells which i don't think necessarily is incorrect i think there's a lot of science behind but it by theory but sure. but i think um wellness people have jumped on board with of course it. so we can't we can't poo poo it but everything's I, a balance mate. yeah that's right and so to say that oh my body is for, for whatever reason, we're thinking that our body isn't, you know, over the millennia hasn't evolved the most effective way to undergo autophagy and that we must improve it, really do, does our body and evolution disservice. And I'm not saying that evolution is perfect by any means, uh, but in saying that, we know that there are certain byproducts that the body produces which we need as signaling molecules, mm. right? And so, for example, oxidative stress, we always say it's a bad thing but it's all about quantity right the dose yeah oxidative stress can be signaling molecules for the immune system for a whole range of things and my assumption working on first principles would be it's the same thing when it comes to autophagy is that we are cleaning up as much as we need to clean up unless there is some sort of um uh, homeostatic dysfunction that's happening that's leading to less autophagy yeah, and I, and I think this is where the science comes in. And at least from some of the podcasts that I've listened to with, I think, fairly reputable um, scientists that... Don't look, name them. ...that work within um, longevity research, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do uh, look at the, 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 the process of autophagy, at, at least one part of it. Yeah. And this is where sometimes 
um, calorie intake and so forth could make the process arguably more efficient. Maybe. Or, Maybe. Or I still take it with a grain of salt. Yep. I take anybody doing longevity research uh, when they uh, communicate It's sometimes difficult broadly. once you translate to humans because yes. we've got – it's such more challenge to – Remove the biases. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to discount longevity research is research, and so I'm not saying that for whatever reason it's just it shouldn't be reviewed. It should be looked at. It's amazing, but look at the papers, and if you know to read research papers, then that's where you should be going. And I get it. You can have people who are great science communicators, people far better than us, who can talk about this stuff. But I think sometimes uh, the answer and the result is lost when it's simplified to a point mm. where people take what's happened in a mouse model and then says, well, this mouse lived 50% longer because it did this. It's like, yeah, well, the mouse only lived for a couple of weeks anyway. So you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, Anyway, so, so uh, peroxisomes and then the, we can finish there. The other thing I'll just mention with disease that come, sometimes fits with lysosomes, yep. there's a couple of diseases, there's a neurological condition called Tay Sachs disease, oh, yes, and that is that is due to a a change in the inability of the. I guess, I guess it would be partly the autophagy effect. I thought it was due to acetaminophen, and then the acetaminophen. Am I wrong? I thought no. there was a. I thought there was a. Ro- this is okay. a genetic abnormality, okay. which is okay. I think an enzyme within that, which leads to uh, the accumulation of lipids within the neurons that yeah. causes cell death. Um, I think you're thinking of a syndrome. Yeah, what am I? What am I thinking of? Ray syndrome. I'm Ray thinking syndrome. of Ray syndrome. Ray syndrome. Not Tay. Ray. So, yeah. and the other one is Sorry. osteo osteoarthritis. Yeah, which seems to also have an effect in lysosomes. Yeah, um, lysosomes, and that seems to have an effect on um, chondroblasts or chondrocytes, oh, which yeah. then degrade the the. Um, Cartilage. Cartilage of the, the bone. The joints. Yeah. Now, the almost there, the, the peroxisomes. Sorry? The peroxome, The peroxisomes. 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 Yep. There we go. So they do kind of two things. One, again, these are endosomes that are, are filled with enzymes, but these are more oxidative enzymes. Yes. So they do a different type of... Catabolism. So the ma- catabolism, yeah. That's yeah. okay. I'll, I'll pronounce all the words that you <laughs> mispronounce. It's uh, been two hours. But they basically clean up oxidative stress. Or they create it. Well, they create it by Hydrogen trying peroxide. to clean it up, right? So they, they turn it from one, one oxidative stress to another, which so what, generally so, is... No, you tell me. So one, one job that they do yep. is they can change really long fatty acids yep. into shorter fatty acids, sure. which then send it to the mitochondria mm-hmm. for beta oxidation. Yep. So that's one. Yep. But in, in part of their, their job, they also produce hydrogen peroxide, yep. which is oxidative. Now, there's some cells that have utilized this for its own function. So this would be also some immune cells, mm. which would utilize this release to break down maybe damaged cells and that's what or, I'm saying before. or mitochondria, or not the mitochondria, microorganisms yep. or even signal to other immune cells to come to the area because we need some assistance. Yes, but then we need to break down that um, perox- hydrogen peroxide yeah. as well. And, but we tend to break that down into water and oxygen. But right, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah, use yeah. different substances to do that. Uh, so that's peroxisomes. Have we covered it all? We the only, the only other additional one is the cytoskeleton. Yeah, okay. All right. So let's talk about the uh, scaffolding, the, the proteins that hold the cell together. What do you think? Yes, let's go. All right. So there's a couple of different ones. First of which... Three. Well, first we need to talk about the cell. fact that it's a cell. Yeah, we, three classes. Okay. Before we go into that, remember that the cell membrane is real squiggly and wobbly like oil, right? I think it's better to say it's like an... A sea or an ocean. Okay, so it's constantly in flux. Yeah, right? that's right. It's important to say that. Uh, but it still needs integrity. So we still need a cytoskeleton within the cell to sort of like prop it up. Scaffolding, right? So I've got that there are like three. Three. Right? Are these yours? Microfilaments, microtubules, and intermediate filaments. Yep. Okay. Same with me. So microfilaments are like actin. Mm-hmm. Now, actin is this thin, flexible protein that's used. Um, it's well, it just holds the cell shape and support. But it's also modifiable. 
Well, it's modifiable in the sense that you can have... So it's dynamic. Okay, just keep interrupting me. In muscle, actin is used for contraction, Yeah, yeah. right? So not only does it f- help hold the cytoskeletal architecture together, but it can actually, with myosin, another protein, form these cross bridges, these cross links, and contract. Yeah, right? that's right. So, so the, in terms of musculature, these cells have utilised their cytoskeleton, in this case the microfilaments, yeah. to do its primary job. That's right. Uh, it's also used uh, in part when uh, cells divide. Oh, which yes. we never spoke about. Uh-huh. But cells sometimes need to make copies of themselves, so they need to read the DNA, double it up, make daughter copies of itself, and then split apart. Yeah, that's a good point. And so What's, it, what are those things called? What are pu- what called? That pull them apart. Uh, in, in, that's in mitosis, right? That's in mitosis. Uh, I think part of that is... Um, what is that called? Are they microtubules? No, but there's a term for them. Um the, the, oh, the spindles? Yeah, the spindles. Yeah, no, that's um, tubulin. Oh, okay. That's, that's, tubulin. The, that's the third type. Well, that's, yeah, one of those three types. <laughs> uh, but actin's involved as well. So actin and tubulin help in the process of mitosis and pulling those two cells apart, um, which I think is cytokinesis, right? Yeah, that's right. So that's actin. So they're the microfilaments. Well, that's one. Do you have another microfilament you want to talk about? No, I think... I think that's pretty much what I had. It's the main one. Would they have cells that actually need to migrate that would use also actin for its method of movement? Because an, an important point here yeah. is cell this, crawling, right? this comes down to mechanobiology. Yes. And I did it. I, I mean, I supervised a PhD student in this space. Yeah. So it's definitely not my area, but... He was an engineering student mm. and I did the biology part of his PhD. And so what he wanted to look at, so the primary supervisor is a professor in microfluidics. Oh, yeah. And so what we looked at in his work was changing the the physical nature of cells can change its phenotype in a way. So if you grew cells on a, a membrane, you know how we usually when we do cellular in vitro work, mm-hmm. you just grow it on a static plate dish. Yeah. or dish, right? In this case, we grew it on a dis- dispensable, not dispensable, distensible. Dis- dis- <laughs> dispensable. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Uh, membrane which you can change so you, we could flex it yeah. or we could put it under strain. Right. And so by doing so, the the cytoskeleton of the cell yeah, would depends. change. So depending so it's dynamic. on dynamic. So depending on the pulses that you use, the type of stress would change the way that the cytoskeleton orientates Makes itself. Sense. Makes and sense. so even to the point where you can go to cell differentiation. So if you were to put a mesenchymal stem cell, so a connective tissue like cell that's very immature, hasn't de- decided what it wants to become. Mm and you put it under different types of physical stress, yep. it would differentiate differently. So it might come become, if it's under shear stress, might become more like a endothelial cell, right. which is what you'd find in blood vessels. Yep. But if you put it under a, a different type of load, it might become more like a tendon mm. or more like a cartilage oh, or even more like a muscle cell. Right, so you're saying that the cell type is in a large part determined by the cytoskeletal architecture. Yeah, that's right. Right. And even and so when you stain for these, so you might put the cell under a microscope, put in antibodies to stain for tubulin, mm-hmm. and then you can see that the way that these cytoskeletons line up, some will uh, line up in the opposing direction to the strain that you put on it, and yeah. some will go um, perpendicular or um, in the same plane as it. Oh, or depending on the cyclic how quick you do it, yeah. um, the speed and all that kind of stuff. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. I didn't think that, that would nec- – I, I would think that it's dynamic. I mean, if you think we're all growing, right? So, for example, my three-year-old son and your three-year-old daughter, they've both got sciatic nerves. So they've got neurons, but they're very small people. So it's, you know, half a foot long, but they're going to grow up and it needs to stretch. Right, that same neuron That's needs right. to grow because neurons and this are is how, mostly post-mitotic. Exactly. This is how neurons <laughs> uh, in the embryo 
they have to kind of grow into the limbs, mm. but it's actually the limbs that grow and pull the neuron with it. That's right. So the cytoskeletal architecture would be changing and will be stretching, which is to the point of what you were saying. All right, so we've got uh, microfilaments, such as actin microfilaments, uh, cell shape and support, cell movement. So this could be muscle contraction but also cr- cell crawling, so the movement of cells like or an movement ame- of structures. They call it like an amoeba. Movement. Like movement, yeah. yeah. Which kind of like crawls itself along the ground. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when like you see these. Like macrophages, right? Yeah. Uh, and also cytokinesis, so that process of the, the cell membrane. Um, uh, and the, once you've doubled up the cell and you're splitting it apart. The second one I've got is microtubules. And so microtubules, tubule is oh, a okay. hollow tube. So right? we, we um, I stain for these in neuronal work. So microtubules must be important for neurons? They're, they run in everything. They run in the neuron, yeah. but they transport things up and down the neuron. So right. if you want... Like the, organelles. Could be organelles. Yeah, I guess it's, that could be organelles or certain products, molecules that are important. So I'm guessing even neurotransmitters potentially. So there'd be carrier proteins that would walk their way up the microtubules. Yeah, I guess so. How interesting. So beta tubulins are a common stain that we use in axons. Yeah. Wow. So, okay, so movement, intracellular but transport. Be, but be the, microtubules would also be part of the flagella in sperm. Oh, yeah, and cilia. And cilia in the apical end of um, particularly like uh, endothelial cells. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, but also part of the chromatids separation, which you said in mitosis. Yes, yes. So the, the mitotic spindle. Yeah. Um, and then the last one I've got is intermediate filaments. And so intermediate filaments are called that because they're sort of intermediate in size. Like if you take the uh, microfilaments and then the uh, tubulin or the microtubules, they're sort of size-wise, they sit in the middle. Um, And again, in my research, these are the neurites. So when we, because I mostly do my research in peripheral nerves, if you cut an axon, it will try to regenerate Mm -hmm. and it kind of almost puts these feeler-like things out to try and re-establish its connection. Right. And so it's these intermediate filaments that try to re-establish. Do you know what type of intermediate filaments they are, like lamins? Oh, we call them neurofilaments, so that's okay. a common stain that we use. But it's just the the, 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 the axon sprouts mm. trying, and I think all neurons do this, they sprout trying to look for connections. Yeah. Because that's all they want, right? Of course, of, yeah. For communication. Yeah. And a lot of them don't um, meet effective uh, networks, so they just kind of prune off and die, whereas you hope one of them will yeah. and that will regenerate the nerve. So there's heaps of different types. So there were the neural intermediate filaments. Yeah. So you can have keratins, they're intermediate filaments. Lamins are intermediate filaments as well. Fermentum, depending mm, on where... The cell type. You, yeah, depending on the cell type. And then you have the other things that are part of the cytoskeleton, which are like the junctions between the cells. Mm. So they will allow the cells to stick to each other, yep. they're like tight junctions, yep. but also gap junctions. Which desmosomes. Allow, desmosomes, which allows the communication between the cells yep. as well. And to keep them together if they're excitable, like if it's a cardiac muscle cell and you need to contract two, if you've got two heart muscle cells together and you want them both to contract, they're going to pull away from each yep. other. So if they're connected, then they both contract together and that's how... In a heart, one cell or all the cells work as though it's one cell. What's that term? Syncytium. Yeah. Love that word, syncytium. And I think we've gone through it all, Matt. Right? We didn't go through the ions and the... No, I don't need to do that. But I think that's something we've done before or we will do. Do we need... So is that every organelle you can think of? Well, not every organelle I can think of, but it's most organelles within the body um, or within the cell, I should say. And I think it covers it quite well. Uh, Now, we usually do listen to mail... But what we're going to do is we're going to do Listen to Mail as its own podcast because we've received, we've been inundated with emails uh, of people not just thanking us for the spectacular job that we've done, but asking us questions. And we want to do, we, well, we don't want to do a disservice. Yes. We want to be able to answer those questions well. So we've got questions that have been asked and we want to do our research and be able to answer them appropriately. So, so maybe once a month we'll yep. have a specific podcast that will... Um, thank the listeners that have sent in emails to, you know, be nice to us, but also answer the questions. Answer questions, yeah. which some of them will require us to do some research because they are That's fine. tricky it's questions, right? 
So if you... Just as long as they're not assignment questions. Yeah, we can tell. We write assignments. So <laughs> uh, if you want to send us an email, you can do so uh, at gu... It's gubiosciences at gmail.com. Uh, or uh, you can send us an email, uh, admin at drmatt.drmike.com.au. Or use the website. Or just go to the website, which is drmatt.drmike.com.au. Uh, ask us a question. Thank us. Uh, if you do love this podcast, please give us a five-star review on the podcast, whether it's by iTunes or Spotify. And if you're watching this via YouTube, please hit the subscribe button if you already have not done that <laughs> and click the thumbs up button leave a comment ask us a question uh we love doing this as you know we do this for free we do this because we love educating people uh we do it in my shed we do and we which almost blew away yeah lucky you didn't uh but the thing is we need support because without you watching uh we can't keep doing it we need a cider skeleton we do we do um if you want to be our side of skeleton, <laughs> send us an email. Anyway, Maddie, thank you so much. Dear listener, thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. Hi, everyone. Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.